There you go. Oh, that's, that's, that's because I'm trying to log on into the document experience that he sent us. <laughs> I had to put the phone down. Okay, uh, are we ready to go live? Yeah, okay, done. Let's go. All right, colleagues, Kathy Brown, is there any update on Kathy Brown? Everybody looks to be here except for Kathy. Dr. Kathy Evans Brown was playing a lot of All right. Mike Lucci is working on assisting Dr. Evans Brown on logging in. All right, colleagues, I'm ready to start if you are. Are you ready? Yes. Yes, Dr. K. Yes. All right, colleagues, I recommend that you keep all of the background, background noise to a minimum so that we can hear each other. First, greetings uh, on this April 1st. I hope all of you and your families are well. Uh, we are well in the staff, as far as I know, and that is very good news. As you know, there's been a lot that has occurred since March 16, when we signaled that the schools would be closed, staff would come, students would come in, I mean, students would not come in, and staff would report for two days, Monday and Tuesday, to prepare lessons and materials to take home and get to students because we were going to close the schools for a good period of time, indefinitely at that time, uh, April 20th, I believe it actually was, but we didn't know for sure, starting Wednesday, uh, March 18th. So the purpose of this meeting is to give as concise an update as possible what we have been doing in Dr. Dr. Cash. Cash, stop, Doc. We, we, can't hear hear Dr. Cash. Stop. we lost audio. We lost audio on you, Doc. Hello? There we go. All right, we're back now. Okay. So three major areas that I'm going to give an update, and then there's some detail, um, but these are our responsibilities uh, tonight. So they will be food and nutrition and wellness all together in my mind, how we are maintaining and trying to extend the continuity of learning for our students, number two. And then number three, what we've been doing to try to provide childcare services for our healthcare workers, our essential healthcare workers on the front lines. Those were the directives from the governor and from the state on what we must do during this shutdown period. So as you can imagine, we have been working much longer days actually than if we were in school my days are roughly from 7.30 in the morning to 8.30 at night, lots of phone conferences, talking from anywhere from the governor's team and the governor's office to the chancellor, Betty Rosa, to Commissioner Shannon Tahoe, to many of our legislators, to Council of Great City Schools, colleagues and superintendents, conferences with our big five superintendents, and with our county superintendents. So a lot, a lot of conferences, meetings uh, have been going on. Also daily with our 18 executive team members and those executive team members in consultation and conferencing daily with principals, all our principals, and many, many of our teachers. So we have a strong, consistent uh, chain of command at this time. Uh, because of the extraordinary circumstances, it's been tighter than even normal uh, because we want to make sure that our messaging and our actions are consistent and supportable. I'm going to be referring to some of the email content 
that I had Darren send out about a half hour ago. And it will be helpful to see some of those highlights because some of those highlights begin to get at some of the questions that you've been asking uh, in preparation for this meeting. So if you look at, Darren, it's called the report from the superintendent on April for April 1st, 2020. How can the board members identify that? How is that in their email? What is that called? Right, that was the very first email that was sent this evening. 439, okay. documents for work session. Absolutely. Nope. Okay. It was at 4.39 p.m. The email subject was document for documents for work session. And that's the only one in there is the Buffalo report that has all the stats, all the information we sent to the governor's office. Okay. So does everybody have that first document? That's what I'm referring to now. It's the updated Wednesday, April 1 report that I normally send to the governor. Yes? Yes. 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 If we still bring it up, it seems to be frozen, so we'll see. What's that? Here. Can you hear me? It, 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 I, it, my, it, it, it didn't. It didn't display it. So let's try it again. Well, it's not necessarily going to come up. Are you trying to display it there, Darren, or are you referring to people to look at their own devices? No. For everyone to look at their own devices. Very similar to how Mr. Petrucci has pulled his up. That's why I PDF'd it. So no matter what device you pull it up on. It'll look the same. Okay, so here we go, colleagues. Here's the main big, big takeaway for the whole meeting. If you could keep this in mind, uh, I think this would help you. First takeaway is that people have been absolutely heroic. Um, every stop, Doc. Dr. Cash. Stop. Wait a minute, Doc. Stop. Somebody's got to mute their mic. Somebody's got a what, Mike? All right, Mike Lucci said, if you all can mute your mics, because when Dr. Cash is talking, if there's something else that picks up on someone else's mic, then that will take over. So if you all can mute your mics. All set? Yep. How does that sound, colleagues? Uh, Darren? Excuse yes. me, Darren, would you resend me that uh, report in another email, please? Sure. I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll forward it to you Thanks. right now. Because I can't bring that one up. It keeps uh, no problem. So, Paul, okay, that colleagues. The computer is older than everybody. I guess it's time to get rid of it. She's not muted. Ms. Woods, can I'm, you mute? Yes, I can hear you. I'm trying to figure out how to mute my mic. I don't know oh, if it's okay. if you can hear it or not. Go down to the bottom of your computer. There is a speaker. It's an iPhone. I think it's star six. Right. My bad. On my phone. If if it's an it's iPhone, I believe it's star six, Paulette. Okay, I've got it. Okay. There you go. Okay. So the really really big takeaways, colleagues, are really two. The first one is that everybody has been amazing in working far beyond uh, expectations and even what I thought was capacity for something that hit us so quickly and we had to make adjustments so quickly on so many, many fronts in running a large complex school system. And everyone has done yeoman in that regard and you'll hear Hello, is is he still there? We can't hear him. Okay, you're not supposed to mute me. Just your mics. <laughs> oh, you no, are you're muted. Going, you're probably you're going, you're going in and out, Doctor Cash. All right, should we mute ourselves? Okay, so we're going to mute this mic too, just so everyone's muted while you're speaking, Doctor Cash. Okay. It's up to you. All right. Whatever works. Can you hear me, colleagues? Yes. I can hear you. I'm still waiting on Darren to forward me that, though. Okay, so did you hear the two big takeaways? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
All right. Next, food and nutrition services are being delivered to children Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm -hmm. Very, very dedicated food and nutritious team are doing that. And there's a team of folks that are supporting the food and nutrition people. Security, building principal, nurses on site, 28 sites, and Bridget is there preparing the food in the morning and then the trucks take it out to the 28 sites. As of today and this afternoon, we have delivered with our volunteers helping, many volunteers, over, over 200,000 meals to our children and families. We're averaging about 44 to 45,000, 46,000 meals per day now for a two day period. So for example, today we had nearly 47,000 meals and, uh, on, or was it, might've been a little less, but the last two times, Monday and Wednesday, been around 45,000 for Monday and Tuesday, and then Wednesday and Thursday. So we can't be more pleased with what the staff is trying to do, putting themselves out there every day to try to deliver these, this food and these services to our many, many families. Been a lot of volunteer help, a lot of donations to make sure our people are safe on the front lines. They all have masks and gloves and protective equipment as they prepare the food and as they deliver the food. Social distancing is also um, adequate and following the proper protocols in that regard. So that's food service and the delivery aspect. On the communication, the community donations, they have been many, many donations, colleagues, and you can see what different folks are doing there to try to, to, to be of service. I'll talk to you a little later about other donations that I'm seeking around technology, hotspots, and so forth as we get to those points in the discussion. Finally, for this part, the, well, not finally, let me say something about cleaning and sanitation. Uh, that process is being followed very rigorously there hospital-like sanitization and cleaning by our custodial staff, even though they've been reluctant for the safety reasons, they have stood up like soldiers and come in and clean these buildings uh, on a regular basis after each use. So I'm very pleased and proud of them. On the continuity of instruction, colleagues. Dr. Katz, can, can we ask questions in between each one? Sure. On this, well, okay. On this slide, absolutely. So that's for the first part with food, nutrition, and wellness. So go ahead. Okay, are there any questions in regards to the food and uh, nutrition and wellness from anyone out in, in the, uh, from the board? I have a question, that's why I'm asking. Obviously not. Okay, so Dr. Cash. Yes. One of the things that was brought to my attention on yesterday is that the mayor has made resources available to pay people in the community who are volunteers to um, to deliver the um, the food and thing like that things like that. Have you heard about that or anything? No, I just got off the phone with the mayor just a while ago. Um, very important topics we've been discussing. Uh, he has not brought up any uh, thing like that, that he's paying anybody out in the community. I certainly can ask him after this meeting is over. I'll call him and ask him about that. But no, I have not heard that. And he has okay, not brought it up to me. Sharon. All right. Yes. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I, it's my understanding that there's upwards of 700 volunteers that have shown up to or that have volunteered their time to deliver things, to do door hangers, to provide information, et cetera. Uh, I'm also unaware of anybody that's being paid for that service. Okay, well, typically when someone calls me, they know what they're talking about. So Dr. Cash, would you take a look at that please? Because um, uh, if our parents are volunteering, I think that they should be, in, and, and people are being reimbursed for the, the amount of time that they're out, I'm not sure how it's being done, 
that I think that it's only fair that our our parents of our school district uh, receive some sort of um, you know accolades as well. And I'm not sure what they're doing, but that does need to be checked into, okay? Because um, the person who came to me is very reliable, and uh, one of the criticisms of the community people is you're taking jobs away from other people. And if you if, if that, that that you know so. It's a, you know, we need to have that conversation because if certain people are receiving uh, pay for uh, for doing things and other people are not, I just like to see, you know, what is the, what's the fine line? What's going on with that? That's all. Okay. Well, and if give us more information. For, you don't have to do it at this meeting, but if you could right. call us or, or email us what you're talking about, we'd be, be happy to look I'll into it. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy. All right. Thank to. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Cash, Dr. Cash, can you provide can you provide some more information on the who the volunteers are? I know I see on Facebook MVP uh, distributing food, but I, it would be nice to know who the other volunteers are. You're you're, you're referring to hundreds of uh, volunteers and agencies, but can I, in an email or something? Can you provide us uh, whom who they are, it's, the groups and things like that? Board Member Woods, that's a fair question. If we're not there yet, but if you look ahead, if you want to look ahead to Tanja Williams' slide for student support services or education services that Darren sent, those are purple background slides. Uh, the information about volunteers comes up right early on in her first slide. And those are the Thanks. groupings of volunteers that we have signed up so far. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to get each of his. Uh emails up and print printing out the items so thank so you the 700 excuse me paulette the 700 are not just for buffalo public schools these are volunteers for throughout the entire district i mean uh city right uh lou uh yes yeah, sharon there they are throughout the entire city correct okay so what i'm concerned about is what what the impact for buffalo public schools and, and that's my that's what that's why i brought it up okay uh, my focus is on Buffalo Public Schools and um, our volunteers and et cetera. Okay, that's what my concern is. I'm grateful to everyone who is volunteering. I'm sure all of us are. Uh, they are heroes and they are uh, courageous uh, individuals. I just want to make sure that if things are being set up, to, uh, that our parents are given some consideration as well. Okay. I would like to speak pertaining to that also. If um, I just feel that uh, that our teacher assistants, teacher aides, and substitute teachers, or the people who are not working at this time, uh, if they can be looked at as first people to respectfully to uh, receive jobs, you know, from volunteering during this time period, because they work in our classrooms every day, so I believe that they should have. Terrence, we can barely hear you. We can barely hear you. Terrence, you could you please now? get closer to your mic? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I was reflecting on is that our uh, teacher aides, that our, um, our substitute teachers and teacher assistants, the people who are out of work right now, that they will be the first people that will be looked at if there is an opportunity to, for jobs for volunteering. Well, don't our teacher aides continue to get paid? Uh, yes, our teacher yeah, aides continue to get paid. You're saying two things, colleagues. The, those people are continuing to get paid. Yeah. Now you're talking about getting paid for volunteering, which to right. me doesn't doesn't make sense. Right, I get you. Um, I don't understand that. Well, I, I don't understand from the perspective that that uh, you know uh, it's happening, and and I'm not sure. You know how it was determined how it would happen that's all but we're not doing i have a, have a comment in dr uh, cash's uh daily brief as of 326 i read it it's about over 75 individuals from the following groups are participating in bps meal delivery as volunteers mvp back to basics stop the violence UB Medical Students, SNUG, Buffalo Public, Buffalo Police Department, Fathers, and Say Yes to Buffalo. Correct. 
Just to put that on the record. Yeah, it's in the materials that, that come out to you, colleagues. All right, on the continuity of instruction, are we ready to go there at a high level? Okay, at a high level, because I have slides related to, to them for Student Achievement Committee, this is just sort of the introduction we're in right now. At the introduction level, we've been working on the whole child and working to support all of our children, pre-K through high school. And you can see in that first paragraph how we are doing that generally. Uh, there are laptop distribution in effect right now with our ninth through 12th graders. There is a plan to go to really two, grade two through grade eight next. But they all have received some form of written materials in the form of a packet, in the form of a take home packet. And that's what many of the districts, I mean, sorry, the schools and the, the teachers and the kids and the families are working from right now. What the big, big, big challenge is, is that not everybody has computer and online access um, with, with Wi-Fi, with, with internet and with hotspots. And it's just a big equity issue. Uh, we have it all across the state right now. And that's why I asked uh, the commissioner and the chancellor to try to get us some smart bond, smart school bond funding as quickly as possible. They sent out an application by which we could do that. We filled out and completed the application. And I put a summary form of it for you in this document. It's $9 million, just over $9 million. And these are the items that we are requesting. And hopefully the turnaround will be within the next week or two, but I don't see it any sooner than that. There's a whole set of bureaucracies that have to happen even when you expedite a situation like this. But needless to say, it's faster than normal times and we have uh, put in for that. Now, meanwhile, while we're waiting on that, we do have, and I think Jennifer had asked this question, we do have one-to-one -one capability uh, for all of our students in grades three through 12 when they're at school. So what we're trying to do now, and it's a big logistical challenge, is pull out all of those laptops that are on carts in all of the schools, over 56 schools, and bring them to the front of the schools and organize them while we're cleaning all of these classrooms, I thought it would be a good time to do it all at once. And, and IT now has a plan in, in play now that next week it'll begin and the week after to try to deliver over 16,000 um, laptops and devices for our grades three through eight. But there again, keep in mind that delivering them is one thing, but having the access is is what the is what the critical issue is but still there will be more children many will have access to the hot you know to the uh, internet and they can begin uh connecting and working with their teachers like so many others are so that's the high level plan as you see it here uh and we'll have more detail on that as we get to the slides any questions around continuity of instruction at this point Yes, I do I have, cover it. I do cover it when I get into student achievement. This is just a high level question about access. Have you had any issues having uh, students uh, request access from Spectrum and their offer to provide it during the school closure? I've asked the state to, to try to get the big providers, Verizon, uh, Spectrum, mm -hmm. to provide three months minimum but three start with three months access to all of our children in the district three months for free uh to, to connect with all of the uh mm -hmm. zip codes and, and the parents living in our cities and she says she's looking into that they're making that request in a consolidated way for all the big five districts because mm -hmm. what's what 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 the challenge is is for us to do a survey 
terms of who has it, who doesn't. You know. Hello? Yeah, we need people to mute their microphones when they're not speaking, please. Any other questions and or committee members? Did that answer the question for you, Ann? Mostly, you cut out for part of it. Can when you, you tell it, I caught you, okay, thanks. I caught you right after you said the request was made to the big five and part of the issue, part of the obstacle mm -hmm. is that kind of access for an extended amount of time. Was there anything after that? Uh, no, there are 2000 hotspots that we do have by spectrum. Those are operational. The problem is that one to one, and I wanted to prioritize seniors first for that um, so that they can stay connected and be on, you know, try to keep them on track for graduation. So that's, we have over 2000 seniors, but that's how I prioritize it so far. If we, as you can see in the box here, we need 28,000 mobile hotspots. And we don't have anywhere near that at this time, but we're working on it. We're working on it. Thank you, Dr. Cash. Just for later, I'm going to ask again, if there's anything that we can do to help facilitate or advocate, but that can wait until later. Okay. Uh, Colleagues, and then just on childcare, you can just- One question see before you go on. Sure. I, I think I heard you say, Dr. Cash, that there's a plan to start rolling out devices next week, and that will be grades two to right. eight? That'll be three to eight. Three to eight. And so they right. would be at the schools for parents to pick up? Not all of them at once. You got to roll it out school by school because this is a logistical challenge. It's a huge challenge because we have to pull them out, uh, see what they have on them, make sure that these cords are, are proper and, and updated. And so staff has to do some checking first and some cleanup with that first. And then we'll develop a plan similar to how we're delivering the lunches and the food for uh, parents to come and uh, pick those up. But a plan, and, and, we may, and, and, and we may work to try to disseminate them in, in some kind of way. I don't know how yet. But communication will come out next week sometime to parents. Yes, the letter is being prepared right now as we speak. Excellent. Thank being you. Crafted. Okay. The letter might come out probably this week. Great. All right. Colleagues on child care. Um, we have, a, I think, a really good plan the way we've done this. The signals were really stressful coming in from the governor about having to open up schools. The age of who we were supposed to serve was unclear. And it just became very, very uh, uh, anxiety-ridden kind of communication. So basically, I, I didn't want to reopen schools and have teachers, you know, do all of this while they have the take care of our kids and, and provide con continuity learning. They basically wanted babysitters for the children in the healthcare. And while we understood that, uh, I thought there had to be another way. Long story short, we're working with the CCRN, which is our uh, child care resource network. And we've been exhaustive working with them. They've been great. Bottom line is they said there's were 800 slots around the city. Uh, in daycare provider organizations. And after we sent out a survey to over 500 known healthcare workers uh, in our city, uh, 200 and some responded. And out of those 225 child care, we've connected with all of those 98 uh, families, and I think we have secured uh, a spot for virtually all of them at this time. So I think that's that's a good outcome, and it fulfills what we said we would do. And our plan was approved by the governor and by the state ed department yesterday. Excuse me, Dr. Cash. Uh, so that's that's the high level uh, information, colleagues. I'm ready to go into the committee meeting.
things unless you have questions at this time for these high level uh, updates that I've given you over the last for the last two weeks. I do have a question, Dr. Cash. Uh, my question is that um, I received a lot of phone calls from parents uh, about the help desk. Um, can we get a report from help desk to find out what's going on? Because a lot of parents are complaining that their tablet's not working, the, the technology isn't working in their home, or or they, um, they're they calling the help desk and what I refer them to do, but they have a lot of issues about connecting and getting the materials on, on their um, tablet. So there's a lot of parents that's complaining right now about it and getting the school. But, in. For the, for how many complaints have you had? Uh, uh, close to 70, 80 different complaints and a lot on Facebook also. Okay, well, we have we have a helpline for that. Um, you know, we have direct instructions on who to contact for that. That's the first I've heard of that. I'm not surprised. I'm not saying it's not happening, but if you have to follow the helpline, it will it will go to the right department, and we'll we'll get somebody to help help with that. Yeah, we can have some type of report just to make sure that the the parents' uh, complaints are being uh, addressed and being aware because. Uh, there's a hardship on some families, you know, when they got two or three different children in the same household and they try and do all the work at the same time and, and programs not being loaded. Yeah, we understand that. We've actually resolved a lot of those issues one by one, but let's let's look at that helpline. Uh, it should be available. Uh, where did I put that helpline? Darren, if you could get that information, it should be right up on our front page of the, uh, and share that with the board when you can, okay? Dr. Cash, are you hearing that zoology is crashing? Hearing what? That, are you hearing that when the teachers are trying to help the students and they're going on online with zoology, it's crashing, it can't handle it? No, I haven't heard that. I've heard it. Darren, make, a, make a note people. of that. I've, we'll got, I've, gotten of complaints from, I've gotten complaints from teachers and parents. And I don't know how to help them with, the, with those uh, those uh, school entities. Dr. Cash, I will. I'll make a note of that. Can you mute your phone? My phone is muted. <laughs> okay, we'll make we'll make a note of that. Any other questions? I'm ready to go into the student achievement slides in specific, and then we can continue our discussion. Mr. Brown uh, has guess, a comment. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I got the information from um, Myra. She just texted to me, so I will send an email out to the board members about the IT help desk. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Can I just make a statement that, I, can everybody hear me? So can I, I make a statement that there are um, some reports that I've gotten back from teachers stating that and Dr. Cash, you had said that there is one-to-one -one devices within the schools from K up? No, three of, through 12. Oh, three through 12, three. okay. Yeah. Three through 12. I, did, I wanted to be sure because the the rumor, or however you want to put it, is, and I honestly believed this myself for a while, is that from K to three, there was also some sort of one-to-one -one device. We, we should make that clear to the public that from K to three, it's more of a group learning because there's frustrated parents that are thinking they're going to also get, you know, one to one devices from K to three. I can see from three to eight, those are definitely one to one, but let's just make that clear um, throughout, you know, maybe put that out there as well that there is not one to one devices from K to three. That's, like I said, three to eight. But that was in 2017 when we rolled out our technology plan a couple of years ago. And uh, we're now having to make sure that those are refreshed and, and up to date in, in everything. So if we were in school, you, we have that capability. Now that we're at home, we have to work through the challenges of pulling individual devices out and making sure they're serviceable to go out to homes and families. Now, pre-K to two is more of a small group. We might have six in a classroom for pre-K, for example. Um, we might have eight 
or or a, you know eight to ten in a in a K through two classroom, so that students will do different things in different workstations uh, as opposed to one to one in our pre K through two grades. Okay, um, I have one one more um, statement, Dr. Cash. Sure. Uh, I would like to see if we can have some type of instructional video uh, made so that the parents can have a better understanding how to use the technology and how to log on and how to um, access the technology uh, by, by working with their kids. Uh, from what I understand we have big brothers and big sisters who's taking the place of the parents who, who just like recently have done that type of work that's in the school that's helping their, helping their little brothers and sisters. So I would like to see some other type of technology that could actually help the parents in instruction and how to use, use the technology. So that's one of the huge concerns that's going on with the parents right now uh, from that question. Yeah, and would they have to access their technology to see it? Or would it be uh, through the television? Uh, it could be through we, the television, maybe um, something sit home, um, a literature sit home on how to use it. Or, or maybe we can um, put something online um, just to they can click on from our web page to show them how to use the technology. No, I understand. I think it's a good idea. It's just that, that if is. it's an online service, then that, that just adds to the to the complication of it. But I think the idea is a good one, and we'll see what we can do about it. You should be aware, and I want to be clear, that yes, while we are we are overloaded on a number of our platforms right now, there's no doubt about it. I'm even having trouble getting into my uh, emails and some of my, sometimes things are frozen for a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, internet all over is being challenged because of so many folks, you know, at home trying to access during the main working hours. So yes, it is a challenge, but usually we're able to get it back up and going within a matter of time. So you'll see some glitches and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have some of that, but we will, uh, continue to work through this. And I like the idea of little tutorials. A lot of our teachers, Mr. Hurd, had to take a tutorial, a brief one, a mini uh, course in order to learn how to do lessons from home, you see. So they enjoyed doing it. And once they learned it, they said, this is great. And it was very helpful. So we need to make that available for parents as well. I understand. I think that's a great idea. There's actually an entire page dedicated to that where we have the how-tos and it's um, under the link where it says resources for parents and families. I can send that link to the board members, but we shared that with the parents and the caregivers and um, also as a separate link on how to access Schoology and all those resources. So I can send that to the board members so you can see. Yeah, but, but there's some confusion because some parents on, from the kids age, they're using Prodigy to Schoology and they're going over to, going to um, Google um, Learn. Um, so they got three different programs they access at the same time, which they have complications with. We are seeing increase in our parent portal usage, and maybe there's an area where we could could that provide some of these additional resources. Darren, keep texting and making note of these uh, items and texting them to Myra if you can, in case we can get a response before the meeting is over. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. It's not, are you still you there? Me? I can uh, there was a big silence. I didn't know what had happened. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. So we're now into student achievement. And Darren has sent out the slides from Ann's team and Myra's team just at a high level again. We have technology factoids or data points. There's some instructional points. And someone's not muted. Can, can, can everyone make sure that they've muted their phone because we can't hear Dr. Cash? It's Ms. Woods. Okay. Why do you think it's me? No, I don't think we name any names. There's a number of pictures that I can't see, for example, right now. And that's okay. 
All right, under technology, colleagues, does everybody have that that, that deck of slides? Yes. Yes. Some of these main points are re reinforced. I don't need to go through them. We've talked a little bit about it, but there are quite a few devices that have been already uh, dispersed to our high school students. Uh, that's the first time we've ever done that, to go 9 through 12. We've done 11 and 12 before this past year. This is the first time that all high school students uh, have these devices. Again, the issue is going to be you got to get in, you got to do the work, you got to get on and connect with your teachers. I've requested in firm terms, but encouraging terms for all teachers to check in with their class of students. Try to communicate and develop a relationship and communicate on a regular basis daily with their group of students and let us know who they have not been able to reach. The truth is that many families are still in flux over this. They've been, some have been devastated economically, as you know and can imagine, they were already poor. And now with this uh, contagion, they've lost income further. So I'm finding that I have a lot of families that have moved. They're moving, and so we've lost contact with them. So I'm trying to develop a way to, to have them get back in touch and give us their latest information from cell phone, parent uh, info, and so forth. So that is a challenge. It's not a great, great number, but it's a significant number for a large school system like ours. What I am impressed with, with colleagues is how many assignments and assessments and discussions have been occurring. In these first two weeks, many, many teachers have developed assignments. They are conferencing with their students. Students are submitting completed assignments back. Um, and I'm very encouraged by that. There's still an issue of not enough online with that, not as many as in a small, say, school district where everyone has a computer and everyone has access. Uh, they probably have a higher number of check-ins. But we are having our teachers stay uh, diligent about this, our counselors, our psychologists. Um, everyone is doing what they can with their group of students. And then I'm very pleased with the professional well, development that is going on. There's over 1,100 courses. What about the guidance counselors? What role are they playing in this? The guidance counselors have been instructed to stay in touch with their group of seniors and work with staff, the principals, and with Janelle, and with the A. All of us are working to do a thorough credit review for all seniors. What do they need? Where are they in their coursework? And making sure that they, their teachers are reaching out to them and keeping them on track for graduation. Okay, so how is this conveyed to the parents? Because um, most principals already know where these students are because they've been tracking them all year, you know, and trying in hopes of getting a decent graduation rate. How are we moving forward? How are parents being communicated with to know what's going on with their children? Are we doing it in a form of a letter? Are we doing it in phone calls and following up with letters? What's happening? Because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find out. In, in good times, oftentimes we have um, situations where parents don't receive information. And I'm trying to make sure that uh, the, uh, the, the schools, including the principal, the uh, support teams, as well as the teachers, are all on the same page in regards to this, that they are communicating amongst each other as well. That's right. That's exactly right. And so I instructed last Thursday for all uh, the ASLs to work with the principals. I gave them feedback on what could go into a template type letter that all aligns across the district up and back down into the, and to the parents as well. So the principals have developed letters that, they, that they're going to send out once, at least once a week, some I, they want to do twice a week. And you have some really good exemplars of those letters that have started to go out to their parents and to their teachers and staff. Uh, they're in, in some attachment that you have here. What is the, the name of that attachment, Darren? Darren? Yep, that attachment was called 
um, principal communications, and that was sent at 4.51 p.m. It also included a video that um, Tanika Sedgwick did to her school community. So that was sent at 4.51 p.m. So pe principals have been very innovative. Teachers have been innovative. Some are doing videos. Some are doing uh, video conferencing with all their staff. Um, but you can see from those letters and some of those videos, that's a sample of how they're beginning to communicate with parents. Also, robocalls are being used, texts are being used, emails are being used. All forms of communication are being used to communicate with parents uh, going forward uh, is, is what I've instructed. So on Monday of each week, you should get at least some communication from your building principal on what's going on and what are the what are the priorities that uh, staff and students should be working on. Okay, uh, Dr. Cash, can you tell me the plan for the students that were, that were not on track to graduate, the seniors uh, that were having difficulties and working with those parents and like, like specifically just to make sure they can get back on track or what can be done? Well, again, if you look at this uh, instruction piece now, uh, co committee members and colleagues, all kind of communication out outreach is, is, is being attempted here. It's a two-way street. So we've got to hear from families, we got to hear from students, and then we, we follow up individually uh, with them. Communication, nothing more important than communication. And you can see here in what the district is doing uh, there that uh, what we're trying to do to stay in touch particularly with students, I've, I've emphasized seniors and not in terms of the, to the, you know, not to the exclusion of every other student, but to really, really emphasize and do even more than we would normally do with seniors. Cause we were already doing an awful lot to try to account for every student who was a senior uh, to try to help him or her uh, either get on track, if they're on track to stay on track. And if they're not on track, give them options and opportunities to get back on track. And uh, we're still doing that. I, I think that we need to take that emphasis to the eighth graders also that would be uh, moving up, that would be graduating also, uh, going to high school, so. Uh, we have that, we have that. Um, all of that is going on with eighth graders with, with every rising student. There's a summer course that we usually have for, for rising eighth graders. Uh, there'll be videos that'll be present, be done by the high principals, uh, welcoming uh, incoming freshmen. So we're doing a lot of things to try to ease that transition. And eighth graders ready to go uh, for the to the next level. That's what guidance counselors, all the staff members who normally have those responsibilities, they have the responsibilities for eighth graders as well. And we can send you detailed plan on all of that. Uh, I've talked and communicated with staff. I saw that those were some of the questions that you had in your uh, questions, and they provided detailed uh, response to them. And, uh, you know, we'll send all of that out to you, um, but I'm giving you the high level understanding that I have about it at this time. No one is being neglected intentionally. What has to happen is families have to also do their part. That's why it's a bargain. Let us know if you're having a challenge. Let us know if you haven't received something or something is that we have a helpline or as a board member, if you hear about it and we don't hear about it, let us know right away and we'll we'll make sure we contact that family. Whatever issue they're having, we'll reach out. Can we repeat that health number again? Darren, do you have that? Yes, the helpline is 816-7100. And that and how many people do we have? How many people do we have manning that line? I'm I'm not sure how many people we have manning that line. Why has that been an issue? No, I wasn't aware of it. But what I what I what I would like to do, okay, is to at least try to uh, reach out to someone and have have this an article uh, put in the paper or something about what we're doing here. I don't I don't have any complaints about that. My concern is is that what exactly is the penetration in the in each grade category in high school? How many students are responding per school? What does it look like? Are seniors 
what percentage of our seniors are, 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 are responding. I sort of would like to know that at this point, particularly since we have two months left uh, of uh, quote and unquote of alleged uh, uh, classroom time, is it possible to make sure that we are monitoring the data? How many students, if you have 50 students that are in a, in a class, how many of those students are participating? And the ones who are not, what resources are being pulled together for them? I, I'm really, really concerned about knowing who are we hitting at this point? Who are, who are we uh, touching or who's responding back? I'm concerned with numbers at this point. I'd like to see some data in that area. Yeah, we are too, uh, Ms. Common. We, we have ways of tracking it, but we can only track it to the level that people respond. Uh, and, and Schoology and Byron and her different, her different programs and systems are tracking that. Teacher but by teacher are tracking their students. I've asked them to say how many have responded, are they in contact with, and how many are they not in contact with. So, if, for example, if there are 10 students in Mrs. Jones's class, She's made contact and is working on a consistent basis with seven students. Three, she's heard from not at all, or one, she's heard from a little bit, and two, not at all, that kind of thing. So that's the kind of data we're trying to get granulated down to for each student. And it takes time. Well, We've only been at this for two weeks. Well, I, under I understand. I just know that what, because as a board member, you know, if the situation is, is that there's not enough staff to make the phone calls or to reach out to parents. I have no problem being available to do that and to call a list of parents and to reach out. I, I, I think the missionary approach is very important at times like this and that we make sure that they feel that we are connected and we want to be, we want to make sure that they're connected. My biggest fear is that somewhere in somebody's house, somebody is assuming that this is a holiday and their kids is gonna graduate from school no matter what. And and I don't know if that's the case at this point, but I would be, you know, I would think that the first two marking periods have been a very important in, in determining a lot of things in the past. I would be would not be surprised if this is not gonna be an issue this time as well. And so that's what my concerns are. I you know, children who think that they're going to graduate, however, they need additional courses and then they don't, they don't get a letter from the district telling them in writing that you, you are responsible for this. And we have a conversation of parents um, running to community advocates in June talking about nobody told me. So I'm just looking for a paper trail to make sure that parents are informed and that they are aware that they're, you know, what's going on in their buildings. That's all I'm looking for. Yes, yes, those are good questions and comments. Uh, we're with you on that. And Darren, as I understand it, that's what your board work session has been focused sessions have been working on, I'm sorry, the uh, cabinet work session, the ASLs, everybody is keeping uh, strict track of these seniors and uh, we'll be communicating them on a regular basis as long as we have good contact information. A absolutely, and um, not to jump ahead, but you'll see that in Tanja's PowerPoint, there is a guidance counselor section and that's what they're responsible for. Our secondary associates have been working with their principals to make sure that those 12th grade reviews happen. And to go back to a point that was mentioned before about making sure that we're touching and um, being in contact with all of our students, that is what um, the governor's office requires also, that we track the number of touch points, they call it, that we're having with our students. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll get to that guidance in a little while because we had pretty heated little discussion about that, but I'll bring you up to date on that shortly. All right, special education uh, colleagues, as you can see, uh, we are modifying the instruction around special education. Uh, there are obviously challenges in following to the letter uh, IEP uh, cons you know, documents but there are some good news in what, what they're trying to do. We're making those touch points. I'm very pleased with what we're doing in general to get, in, to get a hold of our students. School 84, for example, has made uh, excellent contact with every one of those students and provided supports during this time for those highly medically fragile students. Um, also, the annual review meetings are, are going on remotely. 
so that all of these IPs will be brought up to date uh, by year's end, something which doesn't always happen, but now every day uh, our CST and CSE chairs are working on that daily to be to get ahead of that, perhaps for the first time. Um, psychologists and social workers are connecting with students to provide the social emotional support. We're finding that it's not only about academics during this time, but there's a lot of psychosocial emotional work and support that needs to be uh, going on with our students and our families. And we're here to provide that uh, as well. And Tanja and her team have done, a, you know, they've done a credible job in trying to, where the need is being identified, uh, reaching out to our families. Teachers are well aware of this too, and they're providing opportunities uh, in daily schedule and in their work with students to see how they're doing, checking in on them and so forth. This is a tough, this is a tough deal. Just being in home, I don't know how many of you have stayed at home for, for two straight weeks. Looks like I may be the only one uh, abiding by that. Uh, but the point is that <laughs> it's very tough to stay inside uh, and, and, and continue to do that because uh, families have needs. But that's the only way we're gonna start to bend the curve. And while we're doing that, we gotta provide these supports to families. Darren, do you have anything that came out of the work session to add to that? No, not for that point. We're still, there's a lot of things we're still working on and the plans being developed. But as you said also, we are working to make sure that we're very responsive to all of the families and all their concerns. And they've been very pleased with the um, information they're getting and the work that we're providing. Again, the more contact, the more communication, the better colleagues. So in other words, you communicate with us, we'll communicate with you. When that helpline, to go back to Sharon's comment, the helpline is not having a bunch of operators. What it is, is you call in, you identify your concern, and it goes out to the respective departments. And those departments then will get back to that family within 24 hours. That's, that's how I understand it works, uh, Darren. Okay. okay, thank you. Dr. Kesh, are you getting, are you getting feedback from the parents? that uh, especially the ones that have special education needs, they're just overwhelmed with the six teachers used to do this job for them and they're just overwhelmed. Uh, they have packages from art teachers, music teachers, a regular teacher, occupational therapy teachers, and <laughs> several parents are just saying they don't know how, how they're supposed to even keep up. It's just overwhelming. I'm it absolutely hearing the same. Is. It absolutely is. And thank you for that comment. Uh, again, we provide we, we can provide assistance. We can we can talk uh, with the parent. We can provide access to resources. We can help any way we can uh, to keep communicating with those parents. We understand their frustration. Uh, it's true uh, that it is out there and is the case. We understand it. Uh, just give us those give us you know give them the the lines to call, and I'll have some of my top people reach out and then they will get them in touch with uh, other resources as, as needed. Just let us know who's really, really struggling around these areas, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up from there. Thank you. And what you can do, board members, you, you acknowledge their, their stress and their anxiety and, and tell them to reach out to us. Give them a number or let Darren uh, know, and we'll, we'll funnel the, the concern to the proper department and the proper team. Teams are really, really good at working on specific issues once they understand what it is. So, so may I ask Dr. Cass, particularly I since, may I, uh, partic excuse me, particularly since we're talking about um, the health and welfare of our, our students. Um, and I do remember that in the past, there were some vacancies in that area and I'm concerned about are the supports in there that need to be in there, even though there are vacancies that are within those areas. Do you understand what I'm asking? Um, I do, I do. We have vacancies in a number of areas across the system right now. And so just like healthcare workers, I think you're asking, you know, will certain staff and teams of staff be overwhelmed at, at this time? And uh, is there enough capacity to help 
uh, well, what family. I, I'm more concerned with the leadership piece because I know that there were certain positions that were, you know, vacant and hadn't been filled, in, and particularly in the health, and um, I'm trying to think, in the, I'm not sure if it was health or mental health area, but I we had some a vac- uh, uh, couple of vacancies that were there that weren't uh, weren't filled, and I just was wondering, you know, who's filling in those? Uh, should we have people that are put in acting positions to at least so that people can have contact people? You know, um, the last I thought, we didn't have... Um, I'm not sure if it was a director or something in our health area. I can't remember, but um, well, I just know that we have the Tanja is a hands-on, so just let us know, and we'll we'll give it to Tanja, and she'll take care of it. Yeah, but Tanja's just one person. So she had yeah, she vacancies, I think. Didn't she have vacancies in, in, uh, in the health and um, physical ed area or something? Is there a, I, a, I have a question. A supervisor I'm in that. wondering if we're looking into things that are happening in different schools and maybe trying to streamline them. We have some schools that are taking the initiative and going on Zoom. Teachers are doing more. It just seems some teachers and some principals are doing as far as really connecting and taking those initiatives. And then you hear that some other parents are concerned because that's not happening in their schools. Well, are we asking that during the principal's meetings and in contact with the other schools, whether or not, you know, everybody looks at best practices, what's been working, can we streamline principals to direct teachers to at least try and get on these Zoom meetings that seem to work for students? And teachers who don't feel that they, whether or not, other than anybody logs into Schoology, whether or not their students are even doing the work. And the concern is if their only access is, you know, when they get their devices, that's great. But if their only access right now is that physical packet, then how would they even be able to, you know, know that it will maybe if there was a way to phones and do, do Zoom that people can show, show, the kids can show, look, I physically did, did this or just something to give them some confidence that the students are actually learning and that there is a connection. Um, my son had one with all fourth grade teachers and it was great for them the first time they did it, but I suggested that they do that with the parents as well in a separate meeting so that any you know questions can be answered um, that parents have. So I'm just wondering if we have any, you know, anything we're doing district-wide to make sure that's half across the board and not just in certain sort of really look into all avenues. Okay, yeah, so I Dr. Think, Cass, I, could you answer I, my question and finish answering that question for me, please, before you answer her question? I, I, do, I, do I have, am I, am, I real, am I realistic to expect that if we have supervisors and different positions that are open that right now, that we need to be possibly putting people in acting positions so that we can make sure that we're running as efficiently and, and effectively as possible. That's where I was going with that. And that's why I brought well, it up. I'll ask, I'll ask HR about that. I'll ask HR, okay. see what it is, and I'll check with Tanja and see what she needs. And if there's people in a pool or people that we, we, we froze the interview process and all of that. I'll look into that to see if we have a capacity. Thank you. I appreciate, I don't have I a appreciate that. All I want to make sure is that at <laughs> least since we have that we have the hierarchy set up so that, you know, there's enough support for the associates and, and the uh, assistants or whatever, that they can at least have the support that they need to try to put this stuff together. I understand. That's all I, I'm I, got it. I got it. Thank I got you. it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry, thank Jennifer. You I just wanted my question answered. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jennifer, I think, Kelly, here, here's the overall response around best practices and what's getting it down at the level of the school and the school family. The district can do the overview and, and provide that overall big bucket kind of uh, instruction. But what I'm seeing and I'm really in, in pleased and impressed with is look at what each principal now is doing. Look at what each school-based team is doing to connect with their children and their families. That's where the game is gonna be won during this uh, extended closure period 
is that the principals and their staff and teams are going to have to reach out and make sure that every kid is accounted for on a daily basis and keep trying to connect and keep trying to contact uh, with. And the principals have all unanimously not only agreed to do that, they, they are uh, thrilled to do it, and they're very innovative about the ways in which they're doing it. So yes, we're, if you look at the very bottom of um, this slide deck, colleagues, you'll see some examples down there of what principals are doing to connect with their school families. And um, I think that that's encouraging, and I think that uh, we'll continue to share that. We, we, are, we have a professional learning community district-wide now on what's called Workplace by Facebook, and this is what staff is sharing uh, all employee levels. So I'm very pleased with that, and we just have to keep growing it and building it out and out and out. And uh, Jennifer, I think you should feel very comfortable contacting the principals. Darren, didn't the principals say that they they don't mind uh, parents calling them, and then and they'll they, get the resources that they need to their parents? I don't want correct. parents to feel like they're lost in ether space out here, and and the big district is something that you know, doesn't have a voice, doesn't have a face, and we can't get through to anybody. All of the schools are have been instructed and they've taken the ball and run really well so far. They are key points of contact for their parents. And that and right there? Have, absolutely. And the principals actually meet virtually with their associates very often. They share best practices of what's working, what's not working. They act as mentors for each other. They bounce ideas off of each other. And anytime a concern is brought to myself, any district level person, we communicate with that school. The principal calls directly to the families most of the time. So we are really fast in the turnaround of responsiveness to parents because we know what parents are going through and we know how we can actually help our parents and our school communities during this time. So you're absolutely right, Dr. Cash, on that point. Um. I would like to say, I think that the administration and the principal the unprecedented times, you know, things we never encountered before, and the efforts that they're put out along with the teachers are exceptional. And I think that uh, we're leading any district in the country right now on behalf of the efforts that uh, we put together, Dr. Cash, as uh, administrator. Terrence, you have to get closer to your mic. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. I was saying that um, I think that... Um, that the, uh, let me see, I think I'm on mute. Okay. I think that um, Dr. Cash, administrative staff, is doing a wonderful job. About, um, uh, and the principals and the teachers that's been working through this. I spoke with many of them um, throughout the week. Um, and um, they are going beyond the call of duty and trying to help assist their teachers and their students, calling them personally to the home. Also, but I did have one concern about about the clarity because uh, a lot of them, a lot of them stated that they were working you know, on a core subject. Just make sure our children get their core subjects and get those together. But they're also the secondary subjects. Also, um, are there um, focusing on that? Are, are we as a, as a district uh, referring to our, our core math geometry uh, type subjects, or are we going to their other curriculums also? I think that's a fair question, parents, and I appreciate the question. Um, my my sense is that teachers are reaching out, regardless of what they're whether it's a core subject or not. I think we're trying to do whatever we can do. I know Larry had asked a good question about music, for example, and there's some programs uh, out there for music that can possibly be done online or via television. I'm not sure to keep kids uh, engaged at different appropriate grade levels. Um, Darren, do you have a, a sense of that? My sense from Ann was uh, that we're working on all the subjects that it takes as far as, far as a student's load. Even PE, you know, folks have put out videos for PE to give kids ideas of what to do to stay active during the day. Uh, what, what other information do you have, uh, Darren? that I might not have coming out of the work session this morning. 
But no, you, you, you are exactly right. We are focusing on all the subject areas because we have teachers for all those areas, right? So we are focusing on all the subject areas, the encore subjects included, like PE, where teachers are doing videos and uploading them for students to actually participate in. Um, because, you, you know, even though we haven't done the electronic distribution grades three to eight, many of our families do have computers at home that they have been accessing Schoology and keeping in touch with their um, teachers. So absolutely, we're, we're looking at all teachers are actually participating. Right, because right. I really want all teachers to stay engaged, colleagues. I don't want to let the pedal off the metal on this. And uh, all subjects are being emphasized at this time. And just texted me and said all subjects. So if, that there's I, your short answer. If so I could just add... That. If I could just add quickly, as a parent, sure. the communication for me has been uh, fantastic, um, right from the principal on down to the teachers. Um, it's really meant a lot for both of my boys, not just with their academics, but socially and emotionally. My older boy has struggled uh, quite a bit with this change, and I think the teachers have been fantastic in adapting, and right now they're doing week, uh, daily lessons on Zoom with the entire class um, in math. Uh, we've heard from the, the PE teacher, the art teacher, so we're, we're really seeing a, a good, ex or having a good experience with teachers adapting and sacrificing and, and being able to reach out to us and work with our kids. So um, it's, I think there's a lot to, to commend from with our staff and, and how they've been able to adjust to this unusual time um, and to sacrifice um, and make sure they're they're meeting the needs of our students. But I think it is a struggle for some of those students that um, have a disability. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of parents that you know feel like they're not meeting their needs um, and they're concerned about how they're going to be graded or potentially going to be graded. And I know that I think that's coming up next, uh, talking about grading policy as we move forward here. So thank you for that, Larry. Uh, you make a really important point. One is that students suffer too when they're not with their teachers. Uh, far contrary to the belief in my 40 years as an educator, kids really do like to go to school uh, and kids really do enjoy having a good relationship with the teachers and the other people who, who uh, make the village in a school. So they're having a tough time now when during this time, you make that a good point. We're only two weeks in, this, this'll, this'll get tougher as we go along. So thank you for making that point. And that's one of the things we need to help parents with is how to, you know, what do we tell parents? How do, how do you as a parent talk to your child? Schoolwork, frankly, is secondary. How do you talk to them about what is going on in the world right now? What is this illness and this contagion and this pandemic? What does that mean? Because small children, even older children, don't really fully understand how serious this is. None of us have lived through this, and I'm old. This this goes back 100 years before we've had anything close to this. And so it's a really tough conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to have. And I think Tanja and her team and others have provided some resources for parents about how you can talk to your child uh, during uh, about this, about this uh, pandemic. So that's important. Dr. Cash, I'd like to make a comment and ask a question right along those lines. The first comment is just a thank you for the amazing work that everyone has done to get this, all of this on board. This kind of educational contingency planning is extremely difficult. My question is, is about expectations on the parts of parents. So I think that a lot of the parents that I'm hearing from really want the best for their students, really want to partner in the district, really want to do the work right with their students, but are struggling with what the expectations should be in this time. And you just said it really well, is that in some ways the work is going to be secondary because we have to support our students first, socially and emotionally. And we don't, there's access issues, there's equity issues. We don't really know what's happening in, in individual homes. People are struggling in different ways. You know, just to use mine as an example, my daughter didn't get a lot done the last two weeks because I was in isolation in my bedroom. Oh. And we were down there and there wasn't a lot we could do about that. And that's going to be something, unfortunately, that a lot of us are struggling with. And then we have the same problem magnified for students with disabilities, students who are learning English as a new language. 
what kind of expectations can we communicate to parents in terms of what reasonable expectations there are in terms of how work gets done, how much work gets done, how if it's okay, to what extent it's okay to put it aside. If we have a student who's struggling mentally, who's struggling emotionally with some of the things that are going on. That's a, that's a really, really, really important and good question. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> and, and by the way, I hope you are feeling better. Um, thank you're thank feeling you. better. Um, I've been cussing and fussing at the mayor for uh, exposing me and had and they had a plot to do it. Uh, so I've been in for two weeks uh, when they brought me up to the to the press conference and both of them knew. But anyway, that's another story another time. Um, I'm sorry. A little, little bit of humor, a little bit of humor in there. But colleagues, uh, <laughs> listen, what what must prevail over everything is is compassion and effort. That's, that's the two things, compassion and effort. We are not going to be uh, the big hammer here. My fuss with the state today, with all the big five listening and with the governor's representative on the phone as well, is that stop using a hammer politically to, to punish the schools. We feel mm -hmm. like you're beating, you're beating on the schools as if we're not frontline workers too. I said the, the parents are working hard. The teachers are working hard through this, more than you would ever know, Governor. I told him just like that, more than you would ever know because you don't know this space. You do your work, but we do our work. I know this space. And I said, it is an insult to try to cut off a point politically of when we go back to school or when we would be considering to go back to school because you think teachers are gonna go on vacation. I said, what are you talking about? I said, what vacation do you think anybody's going on right now? I said, what teachers need, and here's the answer to your question, Ann. I said, what teachers need and what parents need at this point, who've been working just as hard, if I may say, and I have every respect for the healthcare workers, but they've been working hard in their work uh, night and day on trying to figure out how to extend learning, how to keep learning going, how to have a relationship and keep a relationship with their students, keep that contact, keep that encouragement. They have been working on that just as hard as anybody that I know in America. And I said, so stop giving us these two week increments of when we're going to come back to school or we, or we will be threatened with lack of school funding. And I said, that, that doesn't jive with the science. Your curve, Governor, is going straight up in the air. It's going straight up in the air. You don't have any way you bend it to the right yet at all. And yet you want us back. I said, I'm not going to bring back children. I'm not going to bring back staff in any two weeks. I don't care what you tell us we should come back. I'm not going to do it. I said, now you start getting in line with a month by month, and that will be helpful to us. You give us May 4th, and then we'll look at it a week or two before that, and then we go to June. And we go like that. This two weeks hammer is creating an unnecessary anxiety on our children and on our families and on our staff because you're adding to it accountability. You're adding to it that we got to take attendance. You're adding to it that we got to grade students. You're adding to it and all of that. And then you're saying we're on our own in terms of it's a local decision. I said that's unacceptable. What I want from you. And I said, from, the, from uh, the state ad and from the governor, I want some guidelines on this because we need to be uniform as a big five. I said, I want uniform guidelines on graduation standards, on what regents exams process is gonna be, on what grading, if you call it grading, is gonna be, and I don't want it punitive. And I wanna know what you say, because we educate over half the students in this state. And that is not going to be acceptable that we're doing this in Buffalo and then we're doing this in Syracuse and then over here. Because yeah. you know you're going to come at us about that if you don't like that answer at the end of the day. So long story short, I'm only looking at grading as a value add. In other words, give it your best effort and it'll only be points added. It'll only be um, uh, effort that will be considered to get ahead from whatever we've had at the end of the Friday where we left. So there will be no penalties. 
There will be no late this, late that. There will only be, uh, this is how you can improve your grade from what you had as the end, as of Friday, what was that, the 13th or whatever that was that we, that we left. And so I'm looking at pass fail, frankly, and I'm looking at, you know, value and extra credit and all those kind of things so we can encourage our parents and we can encourage our kids as we go along this. But now, having said that, I don't want to get it to the point where we say you don't have to do anything because then mm -hmm. guess what will happen? No mm -hmm. one will do anything, including our teachers. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful. So I want to send a message that let's do our best. Let's continue to work like you have been. You're doing terrific work to keep in touch. Parents, you do your best, but parents need a break too coming up, see? Parents need a break to reconnect with their kids and do what they need to do to keep their family surviving. That's why this break is more symbolic than just a 180 day requirement kind of thing. So needless to say, colleagues, I'm working on that at the state level for uniformity and standardization. You can help send a message to your colleagues and constituents by simply saying, do your best and, and make the effort. Don't let the kids just do, you know, because they need structure. Kids need structure. They need to be active during the day. And, and parents, if you need help on anything, reach out and we'll help you along. We want to just see your student continue to grow in his or her skills. Frankly, if they read and write every day, I'm happy. You can make up math things to do for kids. And, then, and the high school students can follow and do what they need to do with their high school. But reading and writing and literacy development during this time, that's what's key uh, over everything, rather than trying to stick, you know, precisely to these, to these sheets and so forth. That's helpful. Do it if you can. But your situation is going to vary, and I don't want parents getting stressed out over what is a hard work. If nothing else, parents probably will appreciate teachers a lot more when this whole thing gets on the other side. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Cash, for standing up for our students, our parents, and our educators. It means a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. You're leading the way. I also right. appreciate the flexibility and emphasis on continuity uh, yeah. learning. Thank you for that. Absolutely. So, colleagues, grading we just touched on, professional development, I mentioned it's, it's alive and well, and there's a lot of folks, including our teacher assistants, getting um, professional development. You see some nice examples there of what, what people are tweeting out and putting out. Uh, let's ask any final questions you may have for the uh, Student Achievement Committee work, and then I'll move on to educational support services uh, after that. Any other questions? I want to point out something. Everything you just said was so encouraging to me because it's more than just the, the conversation about what's happening. As a parent, there, you know, some folks, you know, folks are aware that my son has an ICT teacher, there's, o, there's PT, there's OT involved, you know, keep him as engaged as he was and give him the packet while I'm for trying to deal with technology has just really been something stressful. So your approach is encouraging for the score title just as a parent. I really appreciate it. And yes, the respect level for, for teachers is already high, but it's it's just you can't even describe it now. <laughs> Thanks for saying that, Jennifer. We 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 all appreciate it. Okay, colleagues. Uh, anyone else before I move on? Yes, Dr. Cash. I have a question. Uh, okay. My question is about, about the child care services for the parents that work. Uh, some of the concerns are how many children would be inside the facility and where are the, where are the facilities located at? Okay, those are good questions. The the services are going to be provided externally. It's like we're subcontracting those services through CCRN, and that is described pretty pretty well in that first document that we had at the top of the meeting. Uh, Will Carestis has done a great job sort of coordinating, getting all of those entities uh, together. 
Um, but that's that's exactly a good question because I don't know. I don't know the answer to, you know, how many children will be in um, a child care provider providing services for 10, maybe more children. Um, it's it's a good question. And it's one of the reasons that I didn't, I wanted to leave that to the professionals in that space. The child care provider, providers are professionals. They have to be certified a different way than we do as educators for the uh, pre-K-12 system. And so I'm leaving them, and they have a whole set of regulations that they have to follow uh, and during this time as well. Uh, and, and so- okay, are, we, are we utilizing the child care services from people like home-based services, or, is gonna, or are there uh, multiple different services that are um, I think it's just, it's not for everybody. It's just for those healthcare workers who identified a need, those frontline healthcare workers that said, I have children between the ages of X and Y, and I do need services. So they responded to a survey that we that that was developed, and now we're responding to their needs through CCRN. Not to, not to district directly. What we what we aren't doing, Terrence. Maybe I'm not understanding your question. What we're not doing is providing child care for anyone and everyone who needs it. Okay. Just for those health care workers, doctors, nurses, uh, lab technicians, you know, who are working in hospitals to treat patients with this disease. And to Dr. Cash's point. CCRN, when we have those individuals that are entitled to this child care, CCRN lets them know what the available options are. And so because they want the parent to feel comfortable also with where their child will be in, um, you know, in daycare. And like Dr. Cash says, the regulations are very strict about who can be approved to be a child care provider. So, so I can only I, assume and trust that they are following every uh, health safety guideline pertaining to this to this disease. I just have one last wrap up question for student achievement before we move on, which is that can you give us any insight on anything that's happening as we move ahead? Any kind of sense of timeline with guidance coming from NYSED? Any sense of where we might be going next? In terms of what, Dr. Rivera? So um, I know that you're working on grading policies. I don't know if there's a timeline for any of that. Um, I don't know. I'm not even going to ask you what the state's going to give you. At first I was going to, and I just realized you can't possibly answer that. For what? Uh, other than for doing that. Just to have a sense of some of the questions around, um, you know, how long we're going to be out. A lot of parents are asking that. A lot of parents are asking about grading. A lot of parents are asking about what kinds of things can we look forward to when we come back in terms of catching students up or trying to do some compensation learning after we've been out for a while. You may or may not be able to answer any of that. I was just wondering if there's any insight you can give us about what's going on as we're trying to plan for a very uncertain future. Yes, I, I think that's that's an excellent question. And I think that's the question that's on many, many of our minds, uh, if not all of our minds. Uh, and it's the right question. Uh, as you can know, remember I said at the top that there's two types of things. All of the, all of the hard, uh, historic, excellent work that so many people are doing. And then, the, and then the other piece is how much uncertainty still surrounds uh, so much of this because We've never been through it before. And you can tell, especially if you're talking as often as I do to the state bureaucracies and the various decision makers, you can tell how left hand doesn't always know what the right hand is doing and so forth and so on. Although I do appreciate the tone and the support that the state ed department has given us. They've been great and I really appreciate them. The governor, uh, frankly, has, has, has played political uh, with this. Uh, I think he's done some good national leadership, but frankly, it doesn't jive with what I know is going on statewide and locally. We have the highest number of cases uh, almost in the world, in New York, in just the state of New York. And we're acting sometimes like we're in some of these states who think they're immune to it. And I think we should have been, frankly, in shelter in place a long time ago. I think we should have uh, made a decision about closing these schools 
because uh, he we didn't do it until we did it. We we started that whole movement as a group of superintendents, and so we're behind uh, this disease right now. We're behind by two, maybe three weeks, and so the epicenter of the disease won't happen in my uh, watching this. It's not my professional knowledge; it's me watching this stuff professionally from experts every night. That won't come until about mid-May, first or second week in May. Uh, and then you don't come back at the height of the epicenter. You then need time to have it slow down and do like in China and South Korea, where they're starting to actually see uh, very few cases each day now. And we're just a long way off from that. We're a long way. So in short, my wisdom, my experience, my sense of all of this is that I don't see us coming back this year. I don't see us coming back this year. Uh, not in any safe way and not in any thoughtful, reasonable way. And uh, if I think there's any degree of safety involved with it, I won't, I won't deal with it. I won't tolerate it. I'll fight it. And then you have to tell me some, to do something different as a board. But that's my sense. Uh, I've talked to Richard Carranza down in New York City. That's what he senses, and he's in the, in the storm of it all. Uh, and so we're in a very uh, tough state to be in on this because we're not getting the supplies we need to fight it. The frontline people don't have the ventilators. They don't have the masks, the gloves, the suits, the things that they need. They say they're going to run out this weekend. As of Friday, we're going to run out in New York City. And, and New York City, you know, a lot of us are just a step away from that because we, we interact with people from Albany and Albany interacts with New York City. So Buffalo is not immune to this. They say it's 500 cases in Buffalo. You can count on it as probably 10 times that at least. Uh, so I'm very concerned about this and how long it's going to take for us to get on top of it and even feel like we would take our families and our beloved uh, loved ones out into it uh, at this point. So I think the year is lost from a standpoint of what a normal year looks like. That's why the best we can do is to keep encouraging uh, one another, keep encouraging our, our beautiful children, and, and, and give empathy and sympathy to our families while at the same time saying that we, let's keep working on this, let's keep working on this. Because when we do come back, and speaking of coming back, I think next year is going to be a, a toughest year yet uh, that we've ever seen together, because I think the budget is going to be uh, a bunch of smoke and mirrors uh, whenever they announce that. Uh, and thank God we have managed well as a board and as a, as a management. Um, we've managed our funds really better than, than normal and average to at least try to help us as we come back. But it could be looking at 80 to $100 million gap uh, coming back out of this thing, depending on how the governor makes people do it. I think he's going to say that he wants some uh, discretionary money to be able to use it how he wants to use it. See? And, and I think he's already cut uh, the budget. But what we're going to have to do, and I applaud you for, uh, you know, making those efforts at the federal level when I gave you those talking points. But it's what, what, what the way, if I know Governor Cuomo, and I read people pretty quick, especially politicians, he's going to force us all to, to get more money from the federal government. That's, that's where he's going to say, you got to go, go get it from the federal government because I don't have any. We, we're out of money here in New York. And of course, Mayor Brown's going to say he doesn't have any money and so forth. Well, we just got to make sure there that they don't use, use our money. That's a pretty healthy state right now. And he assures me that they won't. He assures me that they won't. So the bottom line is, it's not going to look good. It's not any news that we want to hear. But what it is going to be is that everything uh, that we learn from here to the end could have a silver lining in it. The learning is just like higher education is finding out. Maybe you don't have to go to school every day. Maybe you don't have to be in bricks and mortar all the time. Although I think relationships are important. I think going and being part of things mainly in high school and elementary is mainly for the social uh, benefit of it all. But if we, if we can perfect or get better at learning from home or learning by technology 24-7, uh, then we can advance our students in other ways and we can catch up faster. And a lot of those concerns, I think we could be encouraged that, uh, that we will have figured out how to, how to go ahead 
uh, in ways we've never even you know, imagined before. So I'm encouraged by that, but I think the budget picture is going to be really uh, tough, going to be a tough one. But we'll manage through that. I'm, I I'm promise you, I'll manage you through that. And then, and then I'm, 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 hell, if I live through this, uh, I got, I got to go home because this is killing me. I want to see my children, grandchildren, but we're going to manage through this and get you in a good space so that you can go forward after this, after this virus has, has subsided. Thank you, Dr. Cash. I appreciate that. Excuse me, Terrence, just one second. Thank you for Dr. Cash. I, I appreciate that a great deal. Um, as well as I can just speak for myself as a board member, I support these efforts as you go forward. And please let me know what kind of activities you would like to see us do. Thank you. I appreciate that. We will. We'll reach out. Everybody has a role to play in this. Thank you. Terrence, I'm ready to go to your committee. Do you have a question about this or you want to go to your committee? It's about this. Uh, okay. Thank you for your sentiments. And um, I agree with you in your speaking, your words. Uh, I would just like to ask, um, have any colleges or university reached out to the superintendents about a, a, a proactive goal for next year, about for the seniors to graduating? Colleges and universities? Yes, have they reached out to any superintendents about a, about a proactive goal for the graduating students, for our um, seniors? Not to me directly, but one of the things, the last thing I was going to point you to for, I don't know if, I don't know. It's not on this committee. I think it's on uh, the next your committee, Terrence, is what Say Yes is doing. I've made sure that Say Yes stays active in this work and that they're not taking any holidays and that, uh, you know, they, they also are a group that's tracking our seniors and providing information to them about scholarships and next steps to get to the next level. So we, we do have that support uh, pretty strong. Uh, and you'll see that in the, in the slide in the next section. But uh, no colleges specifically like Madai or Buff State or UB or any of those folks have reached out to me. I'd love to hear from them if they have some ideas uh, of any kind. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear what they have to say. So you can direct them my way if, you, if you've been hearing from some yourself, okay? All right, colleagues. Tanja has put together a few slides. Some of this we've been through, so we don't have to uh, get stuck on anything, but as you can see, Tanja has uh, four or five slides. And I love, I love these donations that are coming in, colleagues. There really are a lot of people that want to help. One of the challenges I'm having now, colleagues, and if you have ideas for this, let me know. There are businesses that want to give money to support hotspots and to support computers and, you know, purchase of computers and help with the equity issue around that. But we can't receive some of these people say they can't, that we can't receive the money directly. They have to give it to a foundation or they have to give it to, you know, another entity. So at this point, I'm, at, I'm talking to David. You, if you have other ideas, let me know. But I'm talking to David to see if they will, will be a uh, pass-through of this money, that they can receive it, and then we make sure that we get it out for the sources and resources that we need it for. Um, but anyway, Ralph, Ralph Wilson Foundation, Buffalo Bills, Teacher's Desk, done great with books. There's not enough donations of books that we can get. So any books that you hear about or find, let us know we want those books and we'll get them into children's hands, okay? Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you see all of the folks there that are providing anywhere, a whole host of things there from wipes and totes and books and scorecards and so forth. Then you see another listing of the, of the volunteers. We've talked a little bit about that. Supplemental health. They, those nurses have been terrific. They've been on site at 28 sites, and that's all of our nurses. So they've been there. And they've been providing not expert medical assistance, but they've just been providing the guidance on those four main things of what to do to stay clean and healthy and so forth. I've also talked to Parent Congress leadership. Colleagues, you can help me with this. Uh, ask the parent leaders, what are their priorities? What are the five things that they're hearing 
from parents that parents need. See, I try to keep things to five or less, and whatever those things are, we'll try to get it uh, prioritized as well and, and get it out to, to meet parents' needs. School guidance counselors, you see there some of the high level things that they're working on with the senior reviews and the principals. And it's interesting, we got SED guidance on helping students who need to work. That kind of surprised me there a little bit, but I do get it. And so we've, we've completed the paperwork there, Darren, to make sure that uh, youth who need to work have their working papers in accord with SED guidance during this time. And then we're providing that tier one counseling support and check in with our students who need that. The tier one are the students who need the most support uh, in, our, in our school system. Support for suspended students and students who are on home instruction. I made sure that that wasn't a gap. At first that was a gap, and now we've reached out to all the families who are either on long-term suspensions or who are on uh, home instruction services, and we've made contact with most of those students, and we're, we're providing resources and things that they can access uh, while, while they have those students at home. Attendance services, as I mentioned earlier, they're asking us to do something with that. Um, I'm, we're talking about touch points. We're not going to be doing any formal daily attendance kinds of uh, recording uh, at this point. I'm not sure how we would do it. So I don't, again, I don't want to be punitive. I want to be supportive uh, around that kind of an issue. It is one of those requirements that we have to record and report daily attendance. It has to do with our financial support but I've asked the state to relax that and the guidance we got today is that they, they, they are relaxing that for this school term. And then student placement and registration colleagues, you've had a lot of questions uh, around that. The early grades have been informed, the parents have been informed of what their placement is gonna be next year. For those uh, criterion schools, city honors and the like, there, there's still gonna be a lottery and we're, trying, we're figuring out as we speak what the process is for doing the lottery remotely. And uh, this, with Dr. Williams has figured out how, how we can do that. And we'll share that with you in a separate email for your feedback before we implement it, because it's something new. And I wanna make sure that we've gotten the feedback that that sounds like something that's gonna be fair uh, before we implement it. And then this, this other page, this whole page, is again, what are we doing to support the whole school, I'm sorry, the whole child in, in all of the wellness, emotional, psychological, and uh, social supports that are needed. And these are some of the high level things that are going on. I like the fact that I, and I asked her to do it as part of some of the things that you've asked about uh, during, during this meeting even, is that you see that we're gonna be providing some online uh, courses for parents in the area of restorative practices, uh, healing circles, restorative circles, trauma-informed care, and so forth. Some nice mini uh, courses that uh, Tanja will be providing uh, virtually and online for, uh, for parents. And maybe videos like parents had recommended earlier, we could, we could get some five-minute videos together uh, to hit the main points around this because no doubt parents are struggling uh, with their kids at home right now. It's a tough challenge for, for all parents. And then there's some things that Say Yes are doing uh, down below that she has uh, added. Dave Rust has an addition that goes with this. Uh, Darren, did you give that one page from Say that, Yes? Yes, it's actually in the same email, the um, educational support email included this PowerPoint and the one pager from Say Yes, correct? Okay. So I've edited and, and looked at all of those uh, pieces, and I think they, they're they pretty representative of what's going on uh, right now. Say Yes has reached out and done some things, like even down to the point of diapers and baby formula and things like that. I think that's, that's extra laundry detergent, mop buckets, sponges, washcloths, you know, they've delivered to the home uh, 20 to 30 per, per uh, worker 
to 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 homes, and I think that's that's excellent during this time. And then, of course, providing that post secondary support for seniors uh, right now. And Mr. Hurd, if you and your and that little group you had, I think it was called um, the mentoring group. If the, if that group could continue, I think that's a service that that board members could do to continue reaching out to your mentees during this time. I think the connection is always important with adults uh, when, when for any of our mentors in, a, in our mentoring programs. Um, and I know you were involved in one with Tommy McClam. Colleagues, anything else on the education support items and work around there? There's a lot more going on than that are even on these slides. This this arguably could be the, in my mind, can, is actually the most important piece of our work during this time. Uh, but I do think that we we have a lot of folks working on it. Ramona's done a great job with the volunteers, for example, because she 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 signs them up and she vets them and makes sure that they will be appropriate for working uh, in that capacity for us. And uh, I'll check, we'll look into Ms. Ms. Cotman's concern, Darren, about are there, are there key positions that are open that we should look at filling during this time because they could give us additional capacity, personnel support. You hear me, Darren? Yes, okay. Darren Dr. does. Fan? Yes. Dr. Uh, um, I just was thinking about um, the virtual pathway program uh, and um, is it possible that we could look into maybe expanding that? I think you had the virtual pathways and then there was the uh, one was a recovery and one was an accrual. And I was wondering, I don't know, I don't know enough about it, but I do know that I do think we have to have an educator there. Is it possible to get some sort of a MOU or some sort of waiver from the state that these children can go online and start taking these classes while they're home and things. I don't know if that's an option, but uh, because, you know, the educational restraints as far as possibly having to have an adult or an educator in the, in the room or whatever. But I just think that since the computer options are out there and we have, the, we have you know, paid for the software, that we may be able to look into that to see how we can expand that to provide additional educational support for our children? Yeah, I think that's a great question and a, uh, a good one. I think, Darren, that uh, Val Kent's program and Ms. Conrad's program over at East are what Ms. Cotman is referring to, but I hear in her question, any student who is overage and under accredited, how can we help that student go ahead during this time? So that's been one and of my mantras to the staff is how to not, let's not fall behind, let's actually go ahead. And we could do that with this technology if the kids have a little support along the way. So I like that. And I think we can look into but that I'm and thinking get an answer. Also of the seniors, Dr. Cash, not just the right. overage under credit. I'm thinking of all the children that may be able to benefit yeah. from it at this point. The yeah. other thing I want to share under education. Point. Thank you. The other thing I want to share under educational support is that Chief Young said that the SRO officers are trying to put together an initiative to raise money uh, amongst themselves, but certainly are looking for donations from the community so that they can give out gift certificates to the most neediest kids in the school. And they feel they know these children because they work with these children and they know that they're going to suffer during this period of time and that they want to be in a position to um, help these children. I, uh, they're talking about giving out $25 gift cards to a, a grocery store. And so um, I said to him today that I would be happy to support an initiative like that. And I wanted to share, share it with the board as well as the community that there are children who are suffering in this during this time. And they were suffering prior to this, but this has created additional hardship. And whatever we can do, particularly what is so heartwarming is that it's coming from our resource officers. You know, they're the ones who have put forth this initi initiative to help our children. Keeping in light that we're still praying for um, uh, Juan Phillips, who I heard today uh, 
mild improvement after nine days. So we are encouraged that he is moving toward the right direction. And so yes. I just wanted to say that this is, this is the heart of these individuals that are they're trying to put together something to help the most neediest children. And um, that's another, you know, that, that's an area where maybe you can direct some people who want to help, you know, uh, give some financial support to also. Okay. Well, I like I like your thinking. Um, I, I will say this: that there are Buffalo is very generous uh, as a city, and people will if if we can get those priorities from the parents um, themselves of what of what the community needs, what parents need, right down to the detail, as you see over here with with wipes and and uh, diapers and toilet paper and all of that, we'll we'll get that. I'd, I'd rather see in kind kinds of donations than money. It's just 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 my experience in times like this, but uh, but well, I they weren't going to give money. They were going to give a gift card to like a store that they could go and use, like they well, could go and use it at a store. Or where they don't need to be going to any stores. But the point they need is, food. Well, they need food. <laughs> we're giving them food Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and for the weekend. No, you giving them uh uh. You giving them lunch and breakfast. You're not giving them. Okay, but let me tell you, let me tell you something. Wegmans is jam packed. Tops is jam packed. Okay, so they go on and do when that. If, if, you, if, if you, 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 you rather you rather have food or do you want this? Do you want this virus? My point <laughs> is, if you say you need the food, we'll organize delivery for you. That's what these volunteers can help do. Just tell us what you okay. need, and we we'll help you. The food bank, Darren. Just this day, just this morning, the food bank of Western New York. Donated what? Go ahead, Darren. Darren, he asked you about the food bank donation. Oh, the food bank. 120 backpacks or something. They, All the backpacks. They, 120 filled backpacks for each of the 28 sites. The free, free more oh, what did they donate again, please? The, can you, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, on, I was trying on. to show. It's on the front page of that first document. Under community donations for food service and miscellaneous use, Feed More Western New York donated 120 food filled backpacks each for 28 sites. That's huge. I mean, that, we, can, we can get that kind of donation on a grand scale if we just let folks know what we need. Okay. So we'll continue on that, on that, on that path. Colleagues, are All you right. ready for the budget? Dr. Cash, I have a question. All right, go ahead, Hope. Dr. Cash, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I have some questions about like how are we as a district moving in the direction of being able to support our students' emotional and mental health through the end of this, you know, perceived time, which you just stated earlier, you don't foresee the schools opening up until the end the, that that we're done for the year. Yeah. And I know. And I know that, you know, myself and many of my colleagues and people, you know, everyone that I work with now, we are all working remotely. And we've all had to move into this space that none of us are really familiar with to continue to interact with our clients. What have we done? What has, I mean, I'm not aware of what has Say Yes done to move the services that they would ordinarily be providing to our students in the schools remotely so that our students can still access mental health services, that's my first question. And then my second question is, and I'm just saying this as a parent, I know that I, and my, and my, my children are older in college, and I have had, uh, you know, all of these uh, arguments, you know, I think that we all know that, that, that the younger people still continue to have this perception that they're somewhat immune from this, that they're not gonna get as sick, and that they really are pushing back the longer that these uh, social distancing guidelines are in place, the crazier that I think the kids are feeling being isolated from their friends. And you know, it's very difficult, especially for parents who have um, you know, difficulty in their own lives and now adding all this additional stress and the, the, the problems that, that they may be having with their teenage children, convincing them to uh, abide by these social distancing guidelines and that they want to leave, they want to go out, you know, what, do you have any ideas about or suggestions of how to support our parents in that? 
Yeah, those are those are really good questions, uh, Hope. And uh, I have more questions than answers on it, but I will say two things to them. One, on the mental health piece, I did ask David what he's doing to try to make sure there's some continuity of services, particularly in the realm of mental health. That is just a huge issue for so many of our uh, children and our families. And so in his one page piece here, he says that mental health services are now provided via phone and video calls. Uh, that's one way. And he's saying that the family support specialists are making home visits. Uh, I think he gave like 20 to 30 homes per day mm -hmm. for, per, per kid, I mean, per uh, worker. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. We have to check those figures, but that's what he's indicating. So I don't know if that fully answers it, but it says right there, if you see that one sheet, you take it at your time when you get a leave and look through. But the point he's making, I said, because I want to see those services continue, David. You're going to have to pivot and make sure that you, you you do what you do when when school is normally in so he's assuring me that he's getting that messaging out and that the workers are doing that um but this is a big bigger boat we need a bigger boat for this issue of mental health and uh i welcome any continued support that you have ideas about or where there might be other other agencies that we can look to to reach out to our families during this time or even you who have a caseload of kids who I'm sure fit the bill for many of this, many of these issues, and they're going to present themselves even more now. Uh, you know, you, you need help. This is always something where our uh, some of the judges, like Judge McLeod, who recently retired, and asked how could he be of help, for example, um, and you know, we sent him to 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 say yes to be just what you're talking about to, to take a caseload of young people who uh, had a particular uh, getting into difficulty with the law and, and provide some mentoring for them. Uh, we can't have enough, just like books, we can't have enough mentoring during this time for our young people. So I would love for more people to sign up for that. But Dr. Cash, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I mean, and, and I, like you, I, I, every day I listen to the governor's updates. I listen to our county executives updates. I mean, I am, you know, uh, right. all over this, okay? Right. So, right. And, but you know, the, the common um, understanding and belief now is that, you know, unless you're an essential worker, you shouldn't be interacting with people that are outside your family. And so, I mean, when you think about, and, and you think about people who are, you know, essentially quarantined with, um, you know, with their abusers or with people who are, you know, the incidents of domestic violence are rising and, Excellent. you know, this you're right. So these, this is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to ask you is, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of students who are, who are living, you know, day to day in environments that are unstable. That's and right. now, now they don't have, you know, even the relief of going to school to get out of those environments. That's so, excellent. That's I'm sorry. That's an excellent point. I don't think we've wrapped our head around that. I don't think, I think that we understand it, but I don't think we have an answer to it. We've sent kids home for an extended period of time to where the problem is in many right. cases, is exactly what you're saying. And I get that. That's an that's a underbelly side to this whole whole closure thing that I, I grieve for these students because while while there might be one step, two steps forward sometimes coming to home with who was it? I think it was uh Jennifer who mentioned how many people might be working with her kids at any one time, like six or seven people. And and that's true of a lot of our family. They have many workers working with them on their particular right. issue. And now we've got them home for an extended period of time without that day-to-day -day kind of uh, professional help and support. And it's not just one day, two days. It kind of kind of goes exponential, doesn't it, Hope? Where they're losing ground it's fast. The more you're shut in, I mean, the, the higher the levels of stress r rise, and also because of the uncertainty of what's going to happen and people falling ill and not knowing. So there's a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety, and I think that we need to put our heads together. And when I say we collectively, I don't know who right. exactly we're talking about. But right. We Karen. need to figure out how to be able to reach our families, you know, remotely to provide the support that they need, not just educational support, but all the other supports that we provide for them, Dr. Cash. That's exactly right. You know who could be helpful, colleagues? 
the mayor's always asking me, how can he help more with, with you know, some of these issues with families and so forth. This is, this is one of the issues that he can help. He also has a conference call on a regular basis with the faith-based community. I think the faith-based community could help with this uh, hope, and, and they've got to be in connection and contact with their, um, with their membership, just like classroom teachers are with their, their students. We, we're going to have to get a legion of, of uh, volunteers and workers to reach out to these families during this time and, and provide, provide counseling and support. So some of these pastors and this should include the county holding, as well. They're holding church. Um, you know, online and so forth. So they can they can reach out to these families and and help and provide some spiritual comfort as well. But there's a lot that needs to be done. I don't have a lot of the answers right now. What I want to do is make that a priority, and we're going to write it down as a priority. And as any any uh, suggestions that any of you have, colleagues, uh, let us know, and we'll try to shape a, a program of work uh, just on that issue. That's a great point that you raised. Uh, oh, now on this issue with the children themselves colleagues this is a tough one because um young people do think that this doesn't apply to them as a matter of fact i had somebody say that this is a this is a boomer remover <laughs> and they were talking about me and my generation you know it's it's just us old folk that's going to be taken out by that and that's not a bad thing the way they were talking and uh and now we make room for these young people to have more space in the world and some i mean a lot of crazy thinking out there because you see it promulgated over on the other news channel i i try to only listen to the intelligent uh, news channels but there's one that promotes this stuff as a fake news and it doesn't really it's all made up and and all of that but my point is that here's the thing you say to young people who think they're invincible because i know this to be true of black people uh, but it's also true of other populations, and that is, black folks, for example, we got we got the sugar, see, we got hypertension, we got diabetes, we got high blood pressure, we got uh, a lot of stress that's unseen, and so do everybody. So does everybody. But it's in our no. This is cultural. It's cultural. I'm telling you. And so these underlying these underlying conditions. If you're one of the family members who think it's it's funny or cute to go out and and risk getting exposed to this disease, and then you come home to a aunt or a mother or a father or a cousin or a sister or a brother who has these these uh, underlying conditions, you basically are giving them a death sentence. You're giving them a death sentence. My my sister who loves her children just as much as I love. We raised six black males together but here's what she said the other day she has type 2 diabetes and she has to give herself insulin so i asked her i said how's julian and darren and kellen doing she said who i said julian darren and kellen those are her adult grand or her adult children she said i haven't seen them in weeks i said why not are you kidding why not she said i'm not gonna have them come over here i don't know where they've been I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and you know what she was saying is they can bring something into me and I'm gonna die. She said, I'm gonna die if I catch this thing. Now, that's just a family member having a talk with that. But you gotta hear what I'm saying. This is serious. This is serious. And if you bring this uh mentality that you're invincible and you wanna come home, see, I go by the thing, don't don't let your older children come home. Tell them to get an apartment or stay away until this thing leaves. Then if you make it through, and then if they make it through, then you see each other again. But you can't, you cannot risk contagion uh, of this disease. It, it will take you out. And it doesn't just have to do with people with underlying. It was a 44-year-old man with good health that passed away the other day of this thing and, and no one quite knows why he passed away and it's starting to see infants and children and other people we don't know we've never experienced this disease so you've got to have a serious talk with your with your older children to just say look take it really really serious we love you i love you i want to see you you know grow up be married have your own kids be successful in your occupation but uh don't don't be out there on the beaches like in florida or in these big uh, king churches where they all going anyway to church. And, you know, cause I was in Memphis. They always told me God is in control. God is in control.
and I don't disagree with that, but you better do a few things too to uh, to take some precautions along the way. Then God will be in control. Um, but, but we're not, we have not gotten a memo in Buffalo yet. I can tell you that right now. We have not gotten that memo. And uh, people are out playing golf. They're out running all around Delaware Park. They're riding bicycles. They got their families out. They're stopping and talking and chatting and, you know, so, okay. And it's not who you know that has it. It's who you don't know that has it. That's the challenge. Stay at home. All right. We ready to go to budget? Come on. One, one more question, Dr. Cash. Okay. Um, I have a huge concern about our children who has given up. Uh, I spoke to a couple of children, including my son, um, about um, that he had frustrations with, with uh, um, services. He had some frustrations with the services, and um, and I was saying, okay, let's make sure we get our schoolwork done, you know, and, and stay on because I'm looking at a loud number of um, hours throughout the day that he has to be on doing his schoolwork. And um, I'm talking to his friends and a couple other friends are saying they got frustrated trying to keep up or trying to trying to uh, keep up with the lesson plan and really just wanted to play video games. So I, I, think I got you. It's a good point. It's a good point. And, and we're hearing a lot about that mental abilities to to do schoolwork themselves. A lot of kids don't go to school, you know, uh, with, with schoolwork as number one thing on their mind as, as in education and learning and to reach out to those students who um who progressively are you know laying on the couch or sleeping or watching television and and don't have parents at home that's out working right now that's not pushing them to do schoolwork. I'm concerned about those kids and um, and what can we do to, to a strategy to reach out to these to these kids in these households. Also, one of the biggest things I've seen that the kids what they are using is YouTube, and they said they see instructions for YouTube to where they can get you know the same lesson you know and understand it better because a different person is teaching other than their teacher, but they may have had some problems or issues with. So uh, looking at these YouTube channels, any t possible way, I know that we have our educational programs already uh, set aside, but have, having our teachers teach on YouTube also, and they can give lesson plans like that, that way it can be widely assessed a little bit more and not have to go through the, the, the parent portal. Yeah, I hear you, those are good ideas. Um, you know, you got to access everything during this time. Let's put it all together. This is this is vegetable soup. You know, this is stew. We got to put all the best ideas together. There are no one best way to do this. Um, wherever a good teacher exists, reach out. You know, think about colleges and universities right now. They they basically said when you come back from spring break or whatever they were on, you don't have to come back anymore. So they were really saying that. The coursework was the was the main thing, and that that you can learn coursework anywhere, anytime. So that's kind of a a, a hidden fact there that we, many of these places aren't really that they're, they're there for the social aspect. So I'm with you on that. You we we got to keep the connection here. It's not that they have to, you know, be be strict and do MIT type work 12, 14 hours a day. But I don't want them doing the the social media and the cell phone and the video games 14 hours a day either during this time. So it's a little bit of a bargain with, again, the parents and the coaches and the teachers. I'm going to call these coaches and say, look, reach out to your student athletes and, and see how they're doing. Check on them. Keep them encouraged that they still have a bright future uh, ahead of them. But they have to do their work. This disease is going to call out folks and and who who really are hungry to make to keep making it and and, and be successful and it's going to discourage a lot of people too it's it's a real uh it's a real divider this thing so we got to work together I'm, we, we've got your ideas noted down and uh, we're just going to all have to reach out and be that family for for all of our young people we'll keep doing it thank you for those comments I just have one comment before you move on. This is uh, Kathy Brown. Um, we're, you know, I work for the Buffalo Urban League and uh, what's happening is these young people miss that socialization. And so getting on what Hope had said about, you know, mental health, some of our counselors are reaching out to the same kids we're talking about 
um, experiencing, you know, the lack of socialization, because, you know, we know that kids go to school half, 50% of the time for the socialization. And so they're doing um, circles, you know, restorative uh, justice circles um, via internet and Zoom. Also, um, uh, working with families to see what the needs are. When we talk about needs, you know, some of these families have basic needs like laundry detergent, cleaning supplies, toilet paper, um, uh, computers. Uh, most of them seem to have internet services. But, Interesting. Um, wow, that's good to hear. Yeah, and so, you know, we've been assessing these families for some time. I have staff that um, work for, I mean, there are case planners who normally would go out to do face-to-face -face contact. So we've done creative and innovative things like um, video chat, health um, conferencing, um, uh, this similar platform that we're on now um, to um, ensure safety and well-being of children and, and, and so on. So I think they received, the parents respect this information and this this new um, uncharted uh, platforms that we all are facing. And it's difficult, but it, it can work. So when we talk about mental health, um, you know, our counselors are working with, with parents because they're stressed out, the kids are stressed out, everybody's stressed out in the household. Um, so I have a couple of houses. Can you hear me? Yes. We have a, we have a couple of households that um, my staff brought to my attention that may have only one device, for example, and they have three school-aged children in the house. So that's right. a concern. Um, yes. So we're yeah. finding, um, you know, issues every day, and I'd be willing to share you know, some of those issues because we're doing our own ass assessments um, as we speak. And Dr. Cash, you mentioned that you needed a, a perhaps a conduit. So think about Buffalo Urban League as a conduit for those donations that you mentioned earlier um, wow. for computers, et cetera. Thank okay. you. That was very helpful, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Welcome. Very helpful. If we Colleagues, when we if we can get specific families and specific groups of children, we'll we'll develop a plan of action, a plan of work to to reach out to them. I I, I work, we work better if we kind of get right operational with it. Uh, we know these things exist, but I got to know right down to the level of, you know, contact where they live, what their phone number is, so forth and so on, and we'll develop a a plan for that group of children who are sharing that common that common need. So we'll get right to work on it. Thank you. All right, colleagues, let me give some high points on the on the budget and then we can um, have a have a discussion about that and then we can close. The there are four or five slides that should be in front of you now. And we've been working on advocating for federal here are our strategies we've been working certainly with our local legislators since january when we went to the state to advocate for, for uh, state funding state aid for next year so they they've been working on that but then came this this pandemic and everything changed so what we then started to do we, we heard the governor, you heard him uh, lamenting that, it, that he's gonna be broke or there's a $6 billion deficit and on and on and on. And that healthcare and education, which were the big portions of his state funding, were gonna have to have uh, significant cuts in order for the state to survive uh, through this period. So, we turned our attention for a moment there to the federal stimulus legislation. Really, it's disaster relief legislation. We kind of have, need to see it as part one of a series of parts, and I appreciate all the work you've done to let your legislators know about it. And they did pass a historic $2 trillion plus dollar uh, relief legislation, 
federal stimulus legislation. We don't know exactly how all of that's gonna be distributed and when it's gonna be distributed and what it means for Buffalo City Public Schools, but my really, really rough estimate is something in the neighborhood of $21 million. Uh, and that will include a non-pub pass-through. So we'll have to conclude those schools that we provide assistance for uh, during the regular times as well. That include the Catholic schools, charter schools, and so forth. So that 21 million at this point isn't enough, not even close. And we'll have to continue to put pressure on the federal government to help states uh, during this time. We had all of those uh, dates and timelines in, in a normal school year when we were going to hear that raid runs and then we were going to prepare a, a budget and get it to you and then have hearings and so forth and so on. I believe the governor indicated today that he was going to give, I don't know if it's for the big five. I have to check to see if it's for the big five, but I know he said June 1 for 700 districts. The, the extension will be for the school board to vote their budget by June 1. I have to see if that applies to the Big Five. Um, because it doesn't always, when he send, signals 700 districts, there's 700 plus districts in the state. And I believe the Big Five are, are not included in that, but I can check. So we, of course, have been waiting, colleagues, on what is going to be the appropriation for for Buffalo, what's gonna be for the state. And it just feels like he's not gonna try to help with all of these issues because we see them come to the surface during this time of how much you've, you've indicated it in this meeting, how much help we need still for mental health, how much help we need still for social, psychological, emotional health, for academic continuity of learning if we do return, when we do return. It's not going to be less that we need. It's going to be, it's going to, if anything, be more. And of course, that's not the kind of scenario we're in. So today, while I can't say what the deficit specifically is going to be at this time, the runs have come in initially and they don't look good. They don't look good for us. Despite what the Buffalo News, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, this 2%. I don't read it that way at all. What I see is a flat budget, essentially, and then I see a deep cut to our state aid of nearly $30 million from flat. See, flat is not even what we were getting in the governor's preliminary aid run, which was like $14.4 million. Remember what we were saying? If we get that, then that has to go right back out to the charter school. Remember that? Now, mm -hmm. it looks like we're not even at that, and it, it, it looking like a flat budget at about $785.7 million, but they're going to cut that by 29.6, and then try to restore it and say you'll get it back in stimulus aid, just back to flat. And that for me is not acceptable, you know. So the aid run is a pandemic adjustment. So they cut us by 29.6 from flat, and then it, it will be offset by a 29.6 million federal CARES restoration. And they did this back in 2009. You remember back when we almost fell off the cliff with the, with, with the funding back then. So I don't think that's a good picture for right now. Now, I don't want to go much beyond that because I want to let, let Jeff and let the uh, legislators come out with what that's going to be. As I understand it, he's the, in the what, assembly and the senator leader over in the Senate. They're having meetings with the governor and they're working through in budget conferencing fashion, what the final numbers are gonna look like and what the runs are gonna be. And then they'll come out and let us know. So maybe there'll be another way that they can make some adjustments here and there uh, to, to try to get much better than that. 
Um, but that's, of course, a, a kind of a devastating picture. And, you know, to force us to be in a position where we got to get federal aid in order just to get back to the ground zero. But nonetheless, we'll do whatever we have to do to try to manage through it. I'm going to try to figure out what the school based uh, budgeting and the overall requests are at this time, put that up against the, the deficit as we see it now, and then give you a picture of what that looks like. And, and then go to work. That's probably about into the top of next week uh, is that work to be done because the ASLs are still working with the principals on their school by school budgets. Um, and then we'll get a conservative picture as possible uh, to, to get to you. I've asked the state to, to, to relax, making us have to do a balanced budget this year. I think that's a tough one uh, to balance if we have to. I, I mean, you know, we we be look. I, I don't know. I just don't want to. I don't want to be um, discouraging at this point until we have better numbers. But um, I, I just don't. I, I expected it, but I, I do. I, my hope is that my our legislators will fight to do things like bullet aid here, uh, extra for high need districts there. You see, that's why I want to wait on these conferencing. Um, we can keep talking to to the people. Crystal's a great warrior for us. She, she fights to the last nth of the degree. Um, but then I see the governor saying, give me as much of that money, and then I will determine how I want to how I want to distribute it and so forth. And I'm hoping he sees uh, a big chunk coming to big five districts because of the, the equity needs uh, that are clear here. So I can't give you an exact picture because these runs just came in at about 3.30 this afternoon, four, uh, 414 this afternoon. Um, but it's but don't regard what the Buffalo News is saying. They they did not take a deep look at that. Uh, and that's inaccurate. What I see is a is a much, much gloomier picture uh than that uh at this time. Um but we'll we'll work through it. We'll work through it. Any questions or comments from these slides? I have a question, Dr. Cash. Um my question is that um we understand that people we have contracts with are laying people off. So with the people that are laying, the companies that are laying people off, say like the, the busing company, um, is there any, any clause in the contract that, that we, um, you know, to save money in these type of areas, you know, that, that will help our budget? Yes, absolutely. We, we have just laid off, well, we haven't laid off, it's up to them. We're not using the service of the yellow buses for the remainder of the year. That will save some money. And we're not, we told NFTA that we're not paying for bus passes uh, for the remainder of the year while our students aren't at school. And, and they understand that. So those are areas to save, but it's not really saving to then spend on something else. It's saving it because next year we may not get the reimbursement for that because that's what the only way we get reimbursement if we use that service and then we get reimbursed as percentage on that. So if we're not using the service, then the reimbursement will be less uh, next year for this year. So I would advise that whatever savings we accrue from that, from not continuing to pay those vendors, that we put it over, you know, in, a, in an account uh, for the future so that, so that we can pay when we do resume uh, for a full school year. Can we get a report on the areas that we can save at during this time? And that way we can uh, look at our budget even more, more effectively. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're working at every area, every penny that we can stay save without hurting kids. Now, we don't want to take away from kids. And colleagues, frankly, you know, I made it early. I hope you, you, you should have uh, been the one to approve it, frankly. But you, you can let me know is I, I made a decision that we're going to continue to pay you know, our employees um, that, were, that were continuing to provide, even if they weren't providing a service or if they weren't at work per se, we were providing uh, that union, uh, the, we were still providing the salaries for them. If you wanna change that or you wanna give me direction different than at the board meeting is when we could discuss that and you can give me your thoughts uh, about that. Dr. Do you understand Cash. what I just said? Colleagues, do you understand what I just said? 
Yes. Can you repeat that. I didn't. I wasn't clear. I did. Okay. Um, so we have about 10 unions. So we have custodians and engineers. We have food service workers. We have so, uh, school security. We have teacher aides and assistants, principals, teachers. Uh, all of those are our employees. TECTA, which are the secretarial staff and white collar workers, uh, many of them downtown. Uh, we're continuing to pay them even though school isn't out, I mean, is out, we're, 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 we're giving them assignments to do, we're giving them work to do that's meaningful and, and will help with all of this work that we have to do. And so that's the decision that we, that, we, that we made. Not everybody's doing it that way, but that's how we're doing it. And that we, you have other ideas, you let me know. Well, only Dr. Dr. Individuals, the only individuals that are not getting paid are your day-to-day -day substitute per diem substitute teachers and administrators. Uh, other than that, every that's right. And the per diem, the long-term subs, we are paying. Thank and you for that uh, clarification, Nate. And another point of clarification: Aren't we obligated to pay them under the governor's executive order? Our understanding well, I don't of the order was, I think the executive so. order talked about essential versus non-essential employees, and. I thought that that order muddied well, up they, a lot of the water, water, then it clarified on that issue. Go ahead, Nate. The, the choice that you would have to make, we, we cannot hold, uh, we have to hold them harmless for not actually coming into work and have to have work from home um, strategies implemented for the non-essential employees that are working from home. The choice that you would have, for example, you know, teacher aides and assistants being one of the groups that's not really doing or performing any work from home at the present time, the choice you would have is to lay those particular individuals off or furlough them so they would go on unemployment and you would not be paying them. Right now, because the governor is only doing this in two-week increments, it makes it very difficult for us to make those decisions on what we do long term because there could be a possibility of us having to recall school or uh, the governor telling us to recall school. And so that's why we've made the decisions we have at this point to just pay everybody except the per diem substitute. Thank you, Nate. Dr. Dr. Cash. Oh. Has there been any discussion with respect to the governor's uh, plan to release funding quarterly going forward? Or, and has there been any discussion about, because I know dollars are going to be tight, is seeking relief for some regulations that might help our bottom line as well? I haven't discussed it yet because it's so early on in the, in the detail of, of whatever these runs are, but that is what I've heard is that not only are we not going to have uh, any increase to the budget for next year, but he's going to actually look at it sort of on a quarter by quarter basis to determine need. And I don't know how he's going to do that, but that's what they're talking about. And I think that's really the worst case scenario for running a large complex organization is that you've got to do it sort of every two months at a time. And that's, that's 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 horrific, but it is what what they're talking about right now. So I don't know. Well, can I, I guess ask what a I'm going to try here. to do, depending on what they say that that is, I'm going to try to get the most. <laughs> I'm going to try to get the most we can out of that, and, and keep keep showing the need uh, of why we should have special dispensations uh, for that, Lou, as you as you indicate. Somebody's well, going to get. Can I ask this a question point. here about unemployment? Uh, somewhere on TV or wherever, I've, I've heard that in addition to collecting unemployment, people can collect an additional $600. Yep. So yeah. isn't that a pay increase for some of our people? Uh-huh. It might be. Well, we've asked... I have asked the teacher aides and the teacher assistants. Isn't that a pay increase for them? Yes. I don't know if it would be for them. I know maybe for the bus aides, it might be. We've asked them to look into that. And if they think they'll do better um, by being laid off, then, then we'll, we'll do that after we've consulted with you. 
So we were asking them to look into that. We can ask the and teacher aides and assistants to do it. But remember, we, the biggest the biggest benefit of the teacher assistants and aides is the health benefit. And you can't put a price tag on a, on the health benefit during this absolutely. time. Absolutely. During this time. So absolutely. I would be I wouldn't recommend it, but we can certainly look at these different things and see what they see what the employee group thinks. Uh, Nate, you can put that down as a note, and you can reach out to these some of these uh, employee groups and see what they what they would like to do. Well, we have, and and the, the other consideration is we're also looking into what the cost is to us um, to pay the unemployment as well, because we you know we're self insured in a lot of respects, and so we we we're mm -hmm. checking in with the group. Uh, that's our our, our uh, unemployment management service uh, in regard to that issue as well. But the two groups we're really looking at now, considering it, are the bus aides and the food service workers that are not coming in right now, um, because we have dialogue with the unions. And, and if it's feasible from an unemployment insurance perspective and we're not going to see increased costs as a result, it may be worth considering for those two groups and any better benefit for them to actually be laid off, assuming we are going to be closed for the rest of the year. Um, so those are two groups we've looked at closely right now. Okay, so, Nate, it would say so that you are also going to look at, or Jeff is going to provide us with the uh, uh, services that are currently, that were previously being offered that we're no longer providing, such as the cost of savings associated with home instruction. I would think the athletics department, there would be some savings there, uh, substitute teachers, what about the medical home instructors, the extended learning time and, and materials that are not being used? So I'm just I'm really going to be interested to see how much of a savings that equals to the district, because um, th those are significant things, significant costs to us every year. So please. Oh, make yeah, sure we're, we're looking at point. every every nook and cranny, uh, Miss Common. So. That's that's Thank in my you. blood anyway. You know that. So we're we'll, we're gonna look to get a savings, but I'm I'm still concerned about what this uh, what this budget picture is shaping up to be. We knew it, but it's a little worse than I than I thought at this time because I see how they're playing it. They're sort of pushing it along to federal. Um, you know. Now, what I do think I they want to wait to. I saw too, Dr. Cass. I saw it too. I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you. I saw it too. I see how it's being played out. Yeah. Yeah. Colleagues, any it's other not questions? Just the, it's not just the governor. I want to say that. It has no, to right. do with it, it has to do with the um representation in um in um uh, Washington as well. Um uh, because when you look at what was provided for the schools for uh on their first uh stimulus package, it certainly was not anything nowhere near even adequate. And no, uh, now to be talking about postponing and not providing it, you know, it, it, it's a strangle. It's, it's strangling districts. Like we're, we're going to be strangled if we don't um, get, get what we need because we have special needs in this district. So don't tell me that they give us the, uh, we have to do the uh, uh, every student succeed at, and then in the next breath, you're holding us by the neck and, and, and squeezing the air out of us. So, you know, that's going to be something that we're going to have to, you know, take up and start yeah. fighting. That's the also look we want to also look at whether charter schools are making out pretty well during this. That's legislation we're looking at because uh, an increase to their tuition rate was on the table as part of legislation. I'm hoping they freeze the tuition uh, at prior rates because that would that would be another hit to us if that gets through. So you got to look closely at that, as you all have okay. been. But these things make millions of dollars difference swing each way depending on how it comes out. Okay, thank you. Uh, 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 well, Dr. Dr. Kirch, I think you should let everybody know that one of the one of our most stable uh, sources of income from sales tax is being impacted significantly. They're looking and saying that with uh, with the shutdown of economic activity, that there might be a sixteen percent decrease in Erie County sales tax, and that's one of our biggest revenues. So um, the Buffalo Stability Authority told the city of Buffalo that they need to look for a line of credit so that they, for both us and for the city, because 
one, we're not going to be getting the cash uh, from the governor because he's changing his his time frame. And also, we, for the first time, sales tax not only is not going to increase, but it's going to be a significant hit. So right. I, I just want to point out those are very large problems. And if our biggest expense is salaries, we are going to have to very much look at uh, reducing salaries as far as uh, the positions not being filled. And the federal government also said that they were going to pay people on unemployment their actual salary rather than the salary rates. So they truly may make out better getting their own salary from unemployment. So those are some of the things I wanted to point out. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Woods. Uh, we're, we estimated 20% in the way we're budgeting. So if it comes out to 16, that'll be good. $5 million for every 10% is the way you look at that. So if it's 20% reduction, it's gonna be it's gonna be $10 million less in revenue that we can expect this year than last year for uh from the county tax. Now one thing colleagues I'd like to say and you know, as I said, I talk to the mayor all the time, and we need to get as many people, it seems to me, and, and, and I'm convinced that, he's, that it's right, to fill out their census forms. These census forms add up to dollars for the city if every member of a household is worth about $2,600. And we have underestimated, not underestimated, we've under collected those census forms for years and probably lost billions of dollars over the years because of lack of uh, you know high percentage of folks filling out those census forms so we gotta gotta think of ways to start generating revenue and as board members you can put out on your facebook or you can do it i actually have a number here that uh, i'll text to all of you there and get it to all of you that you can you can put out wide we'll put it out wide to get people to, to call in get the form fill it out that's that's revenue for the city of Buffalo. Tens and tens of millions of dollars that that's going to be needed when we get on the other side of this. So one little action strategy that we can all get behind. Uh, one last question, Dr. Cash. It's, it's not about the budget, but uh, I was concerned. Pope raised some good points along with Dr. Rivera about the mental health um, issue with people. I would like to just to, um, if our if the Buffalo police feel that any of our students need to be removed from a house, I don't want to see them cater off to East Ferry Detention Center or to a jail. Uh, is there any type of uh, process we can look at that we can that they can take a kid to that's had this, that distributed some type of mental illness or or being in a house too long, you know, and, and fighting that they'd remove from a home instead of going to an East Ferry or to a jail? Uh, can we like keep a building or a school open with the Maybe working with say yes, uh, the education. Maybe they can have a, a mental health evaluation. You know, a set aside for that child. Yeah, that's another good question uh, along the lines that, that Hope was talking about. Um, I think this is an area where maybe the mayor could help with help us with this. If we get in a conversation with the mayor and the uh, commissioner Lockwood, um, maybe we could even use one of our facilities. Um, you know, I don't know quite how, but uh, I, I don't want to see them lock, locked up with the general population either during this time. I think that would be disastrous. And uh, I'm going to call, I, I got that as a note. Darren, make a note of that. I want to talk to the mayor straight away tomorrow about this concern that several board members have raised this evening and see if he has any idea. I think he'd be supportive. Um, we just have to figure out a good temporary strategy for it. You know, we've done halfway points before in other cities. I've did, done some things, but I haven't given it that thought here. So I need to think about what might what might be helpful that in that way. I mean, a lot of our school buildings use a timeout where they're going to an office or to a room where they can uh, take right. a period off and, and meditate and think. And uh, I know that um, Lou and I visited over to the Lafayette School, who does a great job with that also. And I believe that we, we need something like that for the city because uh, the kids are, you know, going through emotional issues themselves and parents and households. And uh, we can find that safe haven for them instead of, you know, that return of um, jail or uh, 
detention. Yeah, yeah. And I worry about gangs. Gangs don't sleep. So they they on the, they on the they active right now and you know it's it's a tough challenge there too. So we need help with this. I'm going to I'm going to talk about it and I think I got it captured what you what you're asking for and if if not it might be helpful to this you and hope send a little uh capsule maybe no more than a paragraph of what your concern is into Darren and uh we 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 talk every day, we meet every day and we we try to solve problems. So put that in to you tonight or tomorrow morning, and we'll go to work on, on that. I think that's very important. A lot of stress in these households because they already had trouble dealing with certain, you know, with anger or with, with depression or, or with any host of issues that families deal with. And now this exacerbates all of that. So, uh, so Dr. Like powder, Cass, when you, like a powder keg. When you're talking to the mayor, and certainly we need to get the county involved in this as well. Is it possible to open up the crisis services line to uh, children, uh, a special one, you know, for children or whatever? Because one of the suggestions that came from one of our principals as far as providing some uh, emotional support, social emotional support, is a 24-hour uh, hotline. Okay, in yeah. addition to that, the idea was the employer system. Like that. Okay, and so mm -hmm. our children need, you know, if they can, you know, be a part of it, because I spoke to David Russ from Say Yes about the services that they were providing, the mental health services, and his people are, are continuing to work their same case role. They have not backed down. They're doing it, but he said to me, that they can handle as many referrals as they receive through the support group that he has through the mental health services. And that it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to expand that during this time. There are mental health people who are available, who, who will work, who are uh, signed up with Say Yes to Education, who can work with them to help this mental health. So somewhere between a 24 hour help hotline for our children, either uh, and, and a, a student assistance program where the students do not have to go through staff but can go straight through to someone and get support because oftentimes they're, uh, they're embarrassed uh, because the people know them or whatever. Those are two great options that we, if, when we start having conversations with uh, the mayor, and I think the county needs to certainly be involved in this because in my opinion, I feel that uh, between Say Yes and the Buffalo Public Schools, we are doing uh, quite a bit of county services on a daily basis. And I feel that they can be involved in that to help us uh, move that to the next level as well. But uh, please, please check into those two things for us, okay? Yeah, we will. We will. That's I'm, good. Those I want to add, too, the, go the governor has his own hotline for um, those that need mental health care. I've actually uh, signed up to volunteer as a part of that. I'm waiting to hear back from New York State. But the hotline number for those that are out there listening that may need to access this in the near future um, is 1-844-863-9314. And that's a hotline for um, anybody that is in need of mental health support in any way that's being provided um, through the governor of New York State's number. office. The number is one one eight four four eight six three nine three one four. There's over six thousand mental health professionals like myself that have signed up to volunteer to provide support uh, to those that need it virtually by phone in any way Thank that you. it can be provided. Wow, that's excellent. That's a, that's impressive. Thank you, Larry. That's really important. Um, Thank and you. Then hope, hope I have a question. You know, some of these youngsters, if they start in, in going straight to some of these hotlines or helplines, sometimes they need legal counsel too in terms of whether they have uh, within their rights or what what are they doing. So, so there might be a legal. Uh, there are legal clinics that that we have, but there might be some legal um, crisis lines or helplines that we. That we may need to set up as well because a lot of these young people they get close to that age where they're not 
apparent, but they, they're getting close. And if the situation at home is just untenable, you know, they may need legal legal help as they try to navigate through these tough times too. Um, and so so that's something that's set up or think about. We'll think about how, how to approach that. Well, I, I think we could try to partner with the assigned counsel program to do something like that. I'd like to talk okay. to you a little more in depth about what you're thinking about, and then we can reach out to the assigned counsel program. Yeah, it's just on along the lines that Larry's talking about and that parents were talking about with these young people. We don't want to get them to into jail. We want to keep them out of that. And uh, but because incident that they may may do is is because of how they're feeling inside, not not because they're trying to commit a crime. And, and well, right. But I, but yeah. I'd like to I'd like to be able to intervene before that happens. And right. like when right. you said powder keg, I mean, I think every one of us has probably had an instance in the last two weeks where you know stuck in close quarters with even people that you love, and you know things go a little haywire because everybody is stuck in the house. We're we're out of our routine. We can't talk to friends, we can't go out. I mean, it's just, it's a recipe for disaster when you have even good coping mechanisms. Yeah, So that's a good point. We, we haven't thought enough about that. So you guys have made some really good uh, points and brought them to our attention tonight. And uh, we'll add that to our, to our work. There's no question. Thank you for that. Well, Dr. Cash, I just wanted to mention that when you're saying about powder kegs and, ch and children uh, being cooped up, that there are a lot of exercise videos that are on Facebook and that I know some of the teachers are reading, they're doing videos and they're reading to their classes every hour on the hour. And there's, there's having to, they're reaching out to the children. But if there's any way that we can get more exercise videos out to these children so they can get some exercise and we can get them some masks and gloves so they can actually walk outside safely because they are going to go outside. They need a plan. The parents need a plan for safely getting their children outside. At least that's what the parents are telling me. And I have this college kid who's up, uh, upstairs over me uh, who's back on doing online learning, and they're going out. So I'm saying that we need to give them ways to do exercise, and we need to get them the masks and the gloves so that they're safe while they're out there, because that's the only way to release some of the stress. Okay, duly noted, duly noted, thank you. Anyone else, colleagues? This has been helpful. Very good, very good. We have some Pray practice class. Class. I believe in group prayer, so make sure that we, we continue to do that. Dr. Cash, it goes without saying that uh, we appreciate the great work that you and, and your staff and all our, all the people, including the healthcare providers, as well as all the support and people that are out there putting their lives on the line for this. And I, I personally am touched by it. My brother is sick. We found out on Monday. So it has been a very emotional period for me. And I say that to say that we walk around and we think that we're okay because we're doing certain things and we're okay. This is a giant. The governor wants to call it a beast. I call it a monster, okay, because at least a beast we know can breathe, eat, drink, you know, we can at least think we can slay it. This guy is a monster. This, this, this virus is a monster. So I just want to continue to encourage you and um, stay away from your, um, stay away from people in City Hall that got germs. <laughs> no, I hear you. I hear you. Hey, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know. I don't know why Lou and Nate and Darren are sitting down there. What's wrong with them? Are they sitting? Yeah, well, Nate, Nate and Darren Great. are okay. I don't know about Lou. Nate and Darren oh, work with each other every day. I knew where you were coming from. Thanks, Sharon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one last thing. Um, the Williamsdale School District did a, did a great thing today. All the teachers got together and they got on the bus route. And they followed, and they went down the bus route to where they normally pick up kids at um, to go to school. And uh, the teachers did like a parade for all their students, and they blew the horns and waved to them. And the parents and the kids came out to like their bus stop, and you know waved at the teachers just to give them like little encouragement to keep going on. And uh, I think something like that might go a long ways. You get some participation. It will. It will a long way. 
it, it'll go a long way to continue to spread this contagion. That's what it'll do. Everything cars. Everything cars. Okay. But the kids, right, we want the kids. God we bless you. Kids. That's what the issue is. Okay, thank you. Great uh, okay, committee thank meeting. You. Take care. Good meeting. Thank you thank all. You. Thank everyone for their hard work. Thank God you. God bless everyone. You, you as too. well. You too. Thank you. Again. Next week. Everybody be safe. Be safe and blessed. Stay healthy. Okay.